All right, so now we back, you know, we kind of took a little break going on, but we back with the visuals. Um, as you all know, Detroit is very near and dear to my heart. And this time, we actually have uh, my co-host back this time. He appears on very, very special episodes. They're actually probably the highest viewed episodes. Uh, Hex even posted our last one, so shout out to Hex right there. Um, just to let you all know right now, the visuals, we back. So as you can see this time, not, not just over the phone. We have my guy Firstborn, and then we have a very, well, very cool. special uh, guest today. You might have heard him way back on that classic album, Search for Jerry Garcia, or you might have heard of his mixtape run with Finn Choi. So without further introductions, I'd like to proudly introduce Jay Hill. What's up, everybody? Jay Hill! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the building, I'm in the building. I'm, I'm, I'm yes, sir. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get this phone here also connected so I can uh, look at the camera and see y'all too. Okay, yes sir. Well, that's only seconds away. I'm almost there. That that's another go thing. Ahead, go ahead and rock, yeah, always been high tech. He always been super high tech, man. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm ready to roll. All right. So yeah, man, it's we 2020, man. And I ain't going to lie, yo. I still find myself listening to classic mixtapes from like DJ Butter. The Iron Fist days, I missed the hip hop shop. So, you know, I wanted to give you a platform, Mr. Hill, to talk about your upcoming within this music industry and what you have going on today. So, let's take it all the way back to when you were first born, first man. Let's start with that. When I first met first? Yes, sir. I don't even think I remember, uh, man. We've been around. Yeah, uh, that's a good question, though. Um, when did I first meet? You first. Hey, it, it wasn't P though. I'm sure it wasn't. We were just doing our thing, man. We were about yeah, who? I mean, probably, probably in passing. You know, like at a show or something. Okay. Yeah, later on, you know, because he always been like when I first heard him. I know I was like, damn, he had his time. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah, like what a lot of people don't know is before I got heavily involved with. Doing music with proof, I was doing a lot of stuff on my own too. That's what like, I'm saying. Lighthouse. Yeah. Or maybe so I, I, before I then. Doing a, huh? I say maybe even before then too. Yeah, you know, doing that thing and you know, recording that sound suite studios, going in there, spending all that money on those reels. Remember, remember, everybody used to record on reels back in the day because we wanted to have that Dr. Dre sound. Yeah. <laughs> You can, real. Put three, you can only put three songs on the reel. It was like $150 a piece. Damn! Yeah. And that's all you could get on there. So for every three songs you wanted to record, you had to spend another 150 on the reel plus your studio time. It was, it was expensive. So at the time, you always went by Jay Hill or did you go by another stage name at the time? Uh, I went by Jay Hill... Uh, Ever since I've recorded and put music out, it's been as, as Jay Hill. You know, back in the day when I was like, you know, rapping in fifth, sixth grade, you know, I had other names. Uh, I was Buckshot for a while. Okay, okay. Buckshot. Yeah. Buckshot. Yeah, Buckshot. <laughs> I, I was mad as hell at Buckshot when he, when he, when he came out and dropped the name. I was like, man, I had it first. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can dig it. I can dig it. Yeah, but it's been Jay Hill. And then, um, you know, I went on to, uh, after I left my label, which was uh, Lighthouse Records, which oh. eventually turned into Black Boy Records, uh, I ended up changing changing up for one of the albums I put out. I put it out under Jimmy the Saint, which was one of my aliases. Okay. That name was actually gave to me by Redbone, mm -hmm. uh, Raw Collection. Okay. He used to always call me Jimmy the Saint. And it just made you want to like put an out a project out under that alias because it's like wow that actually has like a good ring to it hey, too. It got a nice ring, don't it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought it was dope, you know. And uh, I was, you know, so much was going on at that time. You know, I was maybe trying to reinvent myself or some kind of, you know, kind of lost in between, you know, back then and where I was going to be moving forward to. Okay. Yeah, because and, uh, like. Yeah, the album I put out. Under that name was uh, it was for the sake of the city. That was the name of that album. That that's on my uh, 
think I got that album on my Bandcamp page. Okay. It's now, see, I love to say, I love how you have Bandcamp now too. Do you do a lot of like every project you put up on Bandcamp, including your mixtapes, or like you only print like your official projects on your Bandcamp? Yeah, everything that I have out, I'm I'm gonna put that on Bandcamp. Actually, my last album I put out uh, February 14th, the Valentine's Day album. I put that on Bandcamp for like the first couple of weeks so people could just go there and buy it, you know, so the, the returns would come straight back to me. And then I released it, you know, on Spotify and all the other platforms. Yeah, because Bandcamp, you get a bigger percentage when they actually buy your music as opposed to the streaming companies where they give you pennies. Right. And it comes right to you, you know. And so that was a great thing. Um no. And also, and also, you know, with with Bandcamp, it's just I like the independence of it. You know, just for independent artists, it's kind of it's tailored better towards us. And uh, you know, work, working with a lot of other guys, you know, in the industry from Detroit, they I just counseled with them, and they was like, you should put it out on Bandcamp first before you put it out everywhere, man, and just and get that love first to see if people gravitate it. toward. It. Right. Okay. Now, I, I ain't gonna lie, like, the first time, like, I ever heard you was on Big Proof's album now, too, but when I like a, a feature, I'm gonna go and try to find, like, their own music as opposed to their features, right? So, I remember the very first time I ever heard of the, They Want Street Fame. Uh-huh. Now, I was gonna... <laughs> now, mind you, this was, like, before, like, streaming sites now, too, so, like, you really have to dig on the internet for these tapes right now. Man, that shit was prophetic, man. <laughs> yeah, was, that was, I, I love that album. I mean, that album was, you know, the first time where I was able to really sit down and put together a studio album, so I was able to bring in great musicians like, you know, Tony Green. He played... Uh -huh. he played uh, most of the bass on that album, Tony played. I had Greg C. Brown played the bass on Come Across Eight Mile. He sung the hook on there. Greg uh, Brown. Tony played yeah. most of the bass, and Tony was able to bring in a lot of other uh, musicians, you know, to be able to play keyboards and rhythm guitars and things like that. And that's the way I like to make music. You know, I like, I like, I like to be able to build it up and add live instrumentation to it. And that was just a beautiful time for me, man, because I had everything at, at full access and, and, and was just able to put that album together the exact way I wanted to. We recorded literally about 60 to 70 songs for that album. Oh, wow. But I had a complete They Want Street Fame finish before we moved into the new studio <clears throat> that we had. We had a studio out in Oak Park. And once we start recording, you know, I started scrapping songs, scrapping songs, and it, it just became so much. You know, I'm like, okay, well, we're going we to set this stuff aside. I actually put out a song, an album called The B-Sides Mixtape, which was like 19 or 20 songs that didn't even make Street Fan. Wow. So that explains yeah, why there's 20 songs on this actual album now, too, because back then, 20 songs was the standard. Yeah. It felt like you had to make that many songs in order to have an album back then. So I was trying to keep up with the status quo, I guess you could say, but we had so much material. Like I say, the B-Size mixtape was a whole album in itself. And I just threw that out there, you know, before, before I even put Street Fame out. It, it was some classics on there. And then I still have about... I'll say about maybe 40 songs from that era. Oh, wow. Including, uh, you know, I started a group called the Block Boys that had Bodie James in it. Uh, my group, which was H&R Block. Uh, some guys from my neighborhood and uh, some guys from Bodie's crew. We all mixed together and we created the Block Boys. Okay. So I had tons of music from that that's, that still has never really even been heard. I got that on my computer right here behind me. Yeah, he sent me an album, told me to sit on it. <laughs> sit on it. <laughs> yeah, that was Street Fame just... too. first. Oh, okay, okay. That album still hasn't dropped, but I will release Street Fame too. Okay, I got, I, there I it is. I'm sitting on Street Fame too. Oh, 
I'm going to release that one day. I just don't want to, I didn't want to put it out now because people would think that, you know, I just had old music. Yeah. Like you want it to mean something when you put it out. Right. I wanted to put out a few more projects that were current and then, um, you know, with things that are, are going on right now in today's times, it's just so much to talk about, you know, so much to rap about. You know, I had to concentrate and fully focus on this album right here because, you know, I think years from now, people are going to look back at this album and, and, and this will be one of my proudest moments right here. Definitely. Well, especially, too, like, if you're a fan of Detroit Sound, too, like, you're going to follow all of the artists that come out of there to an extent now, too. Like, I remember, like, the very first time I ever heard that Blessings track off of Street Fame. Now, I was like, damn, yo, like, how is this guy, like, not, like, as these, like as big as, like, Obi or back then? But then again, to remind you, I'm only, like, a young, I didn't know how things worked back then. Right. But when I heard yeah. it, I was like, God, damn. Right. It's still process, man. You know, what I liked about the way you came off, man, your delivery, your, especially, you know, your content was always, you know, pertinent to relevant times. You know what I'm saying? And uh, I always was ahead of yourself, man. I always felt that you was ahead of your time, back, even back then, bro. When people take the time to listen to you, they're going to get a pure enjoyment out of it, man. I put my, I put my, they get a pure enjoyment out of it. That's what I want to give them. I take my time. You know, I try to make sure I do it the right way. And like you say, I definitely always try to make sure, you know, I include a message. You know, it, yeah. I, I, get, I, I, don't, I don't get writing slumps, but the slumps I have are if I don't feel like I have something important to say. It's hard for me to just sit there and make music if, if, I, if I don't feel a reason for it, you know? Yeah. Because, like, it's like what we said before, like, you also want to put it out to mean something, but you also want to have that music that stands for something as opposed to, oh, I just put out a trap song. Right, right. And, I mean, I mean, I've wrote stuff like that, too. Okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, I tried, I, I got it to a point where I was, I was trying to write a lot of that music for other artists, you know, but, you know, a lot of times, you know, artists get a little proud. They don't want people writing songs for them. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, and I, I guess also, you know, I was talk, trying to refine my way and, you know, my place in the music game, you know, when, when, when all of the different music started coming out, like I listen to a lot of it. I like it, but I know I can't make that. It's not a representation. Of me. Okay. You know, so right. I, I wrote, I wrote songs for people. Um, you know, I, I did a lot of production at, you know, that might have that sound, but it's not necessarily mine, so I can't really put it out under me. But what it does show a quality in a, in an artist that they have the versatility to be able to give people what they want. You feel what I'm saying? So right. it, it, back, then, back then it was kind of different. It was like we wanted to do what we wanted to do to grab the attention of the people or the people then. But now, as we can see, we're in a microwavable age. They, shit is only hot for a second. You know what I'm saying? Right. Back, yeah. To try to make it resonate, we was ahead of our time too. As being who we were, you know what I'm saying. I fits and all that. We didn't understand. I don't feel like I understand it at the time. Then, like if I knew what I know now, then of course, and everybody say that. But to know that moment, you know, we created those moments, and a lot of people really gravitated towards us, man, and they were built from that. Whether they want to admit it or not, they were built from it. And those Iron Fist days was like. Blood sport going in those studios recording. It was so many it was MCs, like camp, right? I mean, like MCs. <laughs> you couldn't, you couldn't go in discipline. there. You could discipline. Could not go in there and not have a pen. Yeah. You never knew. You never knew who was going to be in the studios. You know, we was at see some friends, or, or you know, all the way to the Michigan building, the last studio we had. You never knew who was going to be in there. You know, recording. I walk in, you know, you had Guilty Simpson in there and proof like, hey, here, you and Guilty on this joint right here. I'm like, shit, I got to rock with Guilty. <laughs> 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 All right, let's go. And I'm going to I'm gonna try to tear his head off because I know he's about to come with it. <laughs> you know, oh, yeah, he dread not. Yeah, the next day I go in there, you know, Marv won in the studio. Okay, you know, damn. You, gotta, you know, you got to rock like that, not to mention the people who was, you know, 
part of the camp, Purple Gang, you know, T Flame and Famous, you know, with Ty Ferris now, you know, T Flame back Boy, then. On fire. But him and him and uh him and Fam- Famous and Flame was ridiculous with their shit back in the day. K- Killer Khan. Oh yes. Shout out to Killer Khan. Ty Ferris. It was some Super MC. That's all I was so <laughs> it, was, it was it was just MCs, man, and you know, going to the Lush Lounge. Oh, legendary spot. Yeah, having to having to have a new sixteen every week. You know, to try to with people. Pick. It was it was a great time. It was a great time. Pick man, hand pick. Man, like I love how you brought that time up now too, because like in a, there's a documentary by Proof called "A Time Will Tell," and in that documentary, what you just said was straight facts. Because I remember there was a scene where he's in this basement studio, and then just filled with MCs. You have Super MC over here. You have uh, T Flame over here. Like there was a sh- there was a lot of people in that yeah, one I was, studio. I was, I was there. I was there in that basement. Oh. It was crazy. I mean, we. 20, 24 hours, put a whole joint together. Yeah, I remember seeing I first. To be a part of that. There's a there's a scene where first is like this, and then he turns around with the biggest blunt I've seen. I was like, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was that was a great time right there. Now, um, I understand like Straight Frame was recorded in two thousand four. Um, if I have my facts straight. Actually, it was recorded between. The end of 2000, I would say the beginning of 2003. Oh, wow. Yeah, up until the beginning of 2004, and then we put it out. Oh, wow. But so, so there are some like songs on Street Fame that were actually recorded in 2002 before we moved into the studio. And then... Some songs some songs made it over, like, uh, let me see. I would have to have a track list in front of me. To I was, I'm going off the top of my head some of these times, too. Uh, I remember Heaters was on that. Um, Chi Chi. I, re- I recorded Heaters at See Some Friends at Proof Studio. Okay. I was supposed to I was supposed to have a session. This is crazy. I was supposed to have a session myself recording at that time. If he hadn't been in the studio for like two days. And then right when I was about to record, he came in. <laughs> He had a sample. What's the what's the singer name? Was it Nelly Furtado? Oh, Nelly Furtado. Yeah. <laughs> Nelly Furtado. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cold, cold blooded sample, and a song that he was doing with her. I don't know if that song ever got recorded, but he came in and started working on that song, so I had to fall back. So what I did, I plugged the drum machine up and I took out an old NFL Films record, and I. And I got that sample from Heaters off that NFL Films record. And I made that beat while he was in the studio. Oh, damn, you so, made that beat too? Oh, shit. Yeah, I made that while he was while he was in the studio recording. And then I just waited, and I wrote the song, and then the next day I went on ahead and recorded that. And we never mixed it. Wow. Heaters was never mixed. Mm. Come, across, Come Across 8 Mile was never mixed. That was the original way that we recorded it with Jared. Jared dropped it clean, that clean. Shout out to Jared dropped the album. I'm so sorry about this, y'all. I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. 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 Yeah, we never mixed heaters. That the, the exact two track that I got from when we recorded, I put it on the album, and I did the same thing with Come Across 8 Months. Damn, you guys never mix like tracks hey, like that. Oh, I never mom. really even That's expected it. that. Yeah, Johnny Terry, uh, Johnny Terry, my boy from high school, made that beat. His dad was in the Drifters, I believe was the name of the group. I don't want to get it wrong. I think it was the Drifters. Okay. And he had a studio. He lived in uh, he lived in uh, damn, I'm, I'm slipping right now. You know. Sherwood Forest. Okay. He lived oh, in Sherwood okay. Forest, which is like a affluent area in Detroit. I think Young Rock has an album, I mean, a song titled Sherwood Forest. Yeah, it's like an area in the middle of the city of Detroit with all these big old mansions, like huge mansions. I used to ride my bike there when I was a kid and just 
ride around and be like, man, one day I'm going I'm to own one of these houses here. <laughs> but, but Johnny stayed there. You know, of course, his dad had did real well. And his daddy had a bunch of old studio equipment in the basement. And he used to let us go, go in there and record. You know, sometimes we would skip school and just go over Johnny's house all day and just me, Swift, uh, Swift McVeigh, uh, Mr. Wrong, which was, his name was Beretta back then. Swift and Beretta was a group called the Rabies. We used, to, we used to always go over Johnny's house and record. So one day I just dropped over Johnny's house and I'm like, man, I'm about to put this album out. It's, it's about finished. It's called Day One Street Fame, man. And I can't put an album out without getting a track for me. So he just played me about five beats off a beat CD he had and come across Eight Mile was one. I remember he went in the kitchen and, and was cooking something. And, uh, when I played that, I was like, yo, Johnny, <laughs> this is it. I need, I need this right here. So he gave me that track and, uh, you know, we took it in, put it together. Greg, Greg C. Brown came in, laid the bass down and sung the hook. And that was it. Wow. See, like, even like with like, even the standout features on that too, like you got MC Breed on this on the track. Um, what was the track yeah. called again? Um, Ball. Ball. Yeah. It's actually, uh, it's actually another version of Ball too. I got that. I never dropped. We dropped that one day too. I, it's, I wrote, I wrote one verse, and then we recorded and Bree dropped his shit. I'm like, oh hell no. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Bree, I said Bree ain't gonna kill me like this, man. So, man, because I, I had already, I had already laid, man. So, so he came, he came to the studio. Uh, I never forget. We sat out in the parking lot. Him and him and some of his guys drove down in, the, in a van, man. And when I tell you that van was cloudy, <laughs> <laughs> man. But we went. Oh, oh, he kind of recorded, recorded. And after I heard his, I was like, "Yo, I got to go back in." Okay. Now, when you were, like, actually putting together this album now, too, because you said, like, there was, like, 20, uh, there was 20 other tracks, like, that didn't make it to this now, too. Do you send, like, a lot of unreleased music to first, like, in, like, in the recent years, just to go back and forth, like, man, we should have put this out. Yeah, there's actually a few songs that should have made Street Fame, I'm looking back on it, and it's a few I would have took off. Uh, that I, I really should have put on that album. And, uh, you know, it happens. You, you know, you, you overthink things sometimes. Yeah. Instead of just, you know, just rolling with it. But I did look back on, you know, a couple of those songs. Like, man, I, I wish I would have put this song on there for sure. But they say that, like, you know, it's trial and error, right? So you learn throughout your... So, so when you actually do put out more projects... Because you put out a lot more projects after that, too. So that was, like, yeah. your first kind of baby, let's say. Right. And, you know, I knew I had some, some momentum behind it. And, you know, I, I, I thought, overthought, rethought again, and just tried to make that album the most perfect thing that I could make it. You know, I'm extremely proud of that album, you know, I think we did a real good job with it, but, you know, like I say, I, I have looked back sometimes like, you know, damn, I wish I would put this song on here or that song. You know, I had a song with Royce at the time that was supposed to go on that song, but because of some things that was happening at yeah. the time, you know, I couldn't put Royce on my album. And if y'all want to know what he's talking about, go watch the Beef DVD part one. Yeah, all of that. <laughs> all of that. So, I still got that song, too. <laughs> okay, damn. See, like, yeah. um, so, like, I can only imagine, like, like when you're in the studio back then and, like, like, did first just ever walk in and just, like, give you guys, like, that mean face, too? Like, when he's like, ooh, that was nasty, bar right there. But he just, like, just walked it out randomly. That ever happened well, first? That should have a lot. <laughs> I got, I got, matter of fact, first, I got a song, man, I made on a, on a it was on one of your drum machines. I made a beat. And I always wanted to get that beat and put a better mix on it. I got, I'm, I made a copy of the song and I put it on, I threw it up on YouTube. Really? It's still up there. I'm going to send it to you. I want to know if you still got that track. All right. Let me see what it is. What's the name of it? <laughs> yeah. It was called uh, The 
wire. I think I called it the wire, like Ferguson and Six Mile. But it was like a it real was- grimy mix of it because I just actually like I came I came in there one time. It was at the Michigan building. And nobody was in there, and I just went in there and just recorded it right quick. Just like dropped it, you know, like ten minutes, and just wow. kept a copy of it. But it wasn't I like a clean thing like that. <laughs> <laughs> I see you, man. I'm trying to figure it out. If I can put it up, I'm watching YouTube. I got YouTube right to just put it up. I'm trying to see how you labeled it. Check yeah, it out. but it was some samples that you had already had in the drum machine. I just had this shit and just made some other shit out of it. <laughs> <laughs> Start popping off the MPCX. Yeah. Like, um, when you're coming into, like, the, the Magnum, I mean, sorry, when you're coming off Street Fame now, too, th- this was released at the end of 2004. So, at the end of 2004, you, um, the first time I've ever heard of you, like from like an artist now too, was Seventy Second and Central. That was yeah. the track where from um, Proof, Obi, and you offer a certain Jerry for Garcia. If I have my facts straight now, so this was like between Jimmy the Saint. I mean, sorry, uh, for the sake of the city and Street Fame, right? That feature. Right. I um after after Street Fame in two thousand and six, I put out. An album called the 67 riots okay yeah i actually just attempted to re-release that uh through distro kid but they're waiting on a couple of emails from uh some people like uh big hurt gotta send them an email to, uh okay to release and i think trick trick so whenever they send that email to distro kid that'll be uh, re-release, you know, on all of the uh, streaming networks. Okay, and, uh, wow. 67 Riots was actually uh, the DJ Exclusive put that out for me. Damn. Yeah, DJ Exclusive had some joints back there in the front. Yeah, he, he put that out. Uh, I had left my label because we had an issue. Uh, Universal Records wanted to sign me. My label didn't want to sign the contract. I thought I, sh- I thought we should have signed the contract, and you know we pretty much had a split there, and uh, it kind of actually trickled down to me and my friends who I bought into the label. You know, with Bodie and the Block Boys and all of my crew, to the point where they, my, the guys at my studio on my label were asking me, you know, we got too many of these guys hanging around the studio, man, and they ain't. They ain't bringing nothing to the table, man. They, they need to go. And I'm like, these guys got talent. Yeah. You know, this, this, is, this is what we need. And in me speaking Looking up, like bro. early bro. Huh? <laughs> Looking like right. early death bro. Yeah. And in me speaking up for them, you know, he wasn't uh, Gus, which was the head of our label, which is my boy. And we cool as hell to this day, but we had some disagreements in them times. He wasn't trying to hear it. And when I bought it to the guys, rather than them like, all right, Jay, let's go, they wanted to stick around. Okay. And I'm like, y'all do understand that he's he talking about y'all. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually, we actually got to the point where a lot of me and my guys wasn't talking. And it was some dis, it was some diss records flying back and forth on that 67 album, 67 Rides album, because I got wind that they had been recording disc records about me, which they were, you know, I heard some of them. And that was kind of a bad situation right there. But we got past it, you know, but it made for some great music. Uh, the only time I ever recorded over a Jay Dilla beat oh, wow. was on that record. Uh, a song called Next Year, where I pretty much dissed my whole label. <laughs> oh, yeah, Man. but uh, uh, who, who play? Uh, DJ Butter played that record all the time. That next year record. Hmm. Uh, Proof gave me that beat. And then he recorded a song over the beat too. <laughs> <laughs> and I always tell him mine was better. <laughs> I, put, <laughs> I put that record out in 2006. Okay. And then uh, I've been searching for Jerry. You know, that's when... Uh, 72nd and Central and all that came after that. Okay. Wow. So you actually have like a tape called 67 Riots. Is that based on the, the Detroit Riots back then? 
actually how I came up with that title is crazy because uh, my mom was involved when the 67 riots first popped off. Okay. Like, literally looking out of her apartment window down at the situation. So she used to always tell me the stories about the 67 riots. It always stuck in my head. And, you know, I was born into that neighborhood and grew up right there in the area where all of that happened. So I associated the 67 riots with turmoil. And at that time, I was going through a shit ton of turmoil between my label, uh, my relationship, a relationship with my friends. You know, it was like, not knowing who to trust, and it just seemed perfect to me. Oh, uh, that should have had you questioning yourself. Yeah, but it didn't exactly speak, you know, to those times and the things that were going on with the riots. Yeah. But I guess it was kind of just a turmoil within me and around me at that time. And that's why I came up with the with the name of that. Uh, my nephew, who was DJ Ray, he's uh, one of the big DJs at JLB right now. You know, he's been listening to the records that I'm making right now for this album I'm about to put out. And he actually suggested I named it 67 Riots 2. But, you know, I, I don't want to go back, you know. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think if I would have never used that 67 Riots, I'd, I might have used it this time. But, yeah, for this go around because, like, it's, it's just happening right now. Right, it's right now. So, but. Prophetic. I'm between two names right now for this album that's coming out right now. We can probably get to the end of that and reveal it on this show. Oh, oh yeah, that'd be that. Yeah, Hello, dope. We got an exclusive right here. Um, yeah. So I gotta ask you guys this now too, because I documented this artist before like people started to catch on to him. Now, like I was early on this guy, like from the Purple Game days. Now too, like he appeared on the show twice now, and just to see like the phenomenal growth that this guy been. So like. When you guys see, like, an artist like Ty Ferris start out with you guys and you see, like, the acclaim he's getting now, like, you guys knew that back then. Phenomenal. Uh, I talk to him all the time. You know, with all this new the digital age and all this new stuff with computers, I kind of fell behind a little bit. And he's actually one of the people who I talk to the most to give me tips on, you know, you need to do this. You know, you look at somebody to press you up some... Some wax, you need to do it like this. You need to make sure, you know, you got your sound is changed and all that. Like, me and him chop it up, you know, on issues like that, you know, to try to help me get my stuff in order. Because if you watch what he do with his music now, I mean, top well, no, no, no. quality as far as his product, as far as his production, his sound, his bars. I mean, it's phenomenal to see the growth that that guy has went you know, growing into, man, and I, lo I love watching him. I mean, I, I praise him all the time on my social networks for what he does because, uh, like you said, you you could you definitely see the growth. And right now, I mean, he's taking off with it. I couldn't be prouder of him. You know, same same thing with Bodie right now. Oh, yeah, shout to out to Mr. Bojack. I talked to Bodie two days ago. Okay. I mean, it's Bodie, Bodie stuff is, is, is blowing up you know, out the door right now, you know, and I, a lot of times when I talk to Bodie now, you know, it's just, it's more about life stuff, you know, I tell him, you know, I, I see you spend a lot, a lot of time with your kids right now, you know, that's, that's good, man. Yeah. You know, they're young, they're young right now, you know, I, I, I had, I had my kids young, so my kids are grown. My, I was going to ask son, you guys if you guys have kids. Yeah, my son, my son putting out records right now. <laughs> you know, oh, damn, right? okay. <laughs> yeah. So my, my kids are out of high school and, you know, he got young kids right now. And I, and I was just telling him, you know, we was talking the other day. I'm like, man, they're not going to forget that. Yeah. When they, when they get older, you know, regardless of whatever go on, you know, relationships or whatever, the time that you spend and you put in with them kids, they ain't going to forget it, man. And just and keep that up. I'm, I, I told them I'm watching you. I see you, man. I'm proud of that guy. Yeah. And like, just to see like the growth now too, because like you guys known these artist before like people like all the way in Canada were like boldly boldly you're tie 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 like you guys like knew like so it just I wonder like the inspiration that gives the both for you guys now to including you first now too because when you guys see like an artist 
go from relatively unknown to be one of the most high end demanded artists in the music industry. Like, what does that give you? And like the time span too. We're talking from like what two thousand and five, you know, them to they were in twenty twenty. Right. I mean, right. you just you just can't help, help but smile for somebody because that's a that's a MC's dream. Yeah. You know, to be able to have access to the world and let people hear, you know, what you got to say. And just, you know, just to know guys is out here getting on like that, man, it's, it's, it's inspiring. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of vindicating, you know, because for years, you know, you'll listen to these cats like, man, are people not hearing this? Yeah. I mean, I put up, I put up a status. I think it was probably like 2015 and I was talking about Ty Ferris and I was like, you know, people can't, can't be listening and not appreciate this shit. Yeah. I hear it. And I know I got an ear. Found it on Shade 4 5. That shit was crazy. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, back when he put out, you know, Booming System, that, that, that shit was crazy. Mm-hmm. You know, it was like, you know, just watching that, watching that growth, man, it's, it's, it's great. It's great for the city. And, you know, we all happy about that. See, like, and I even told first too, like, when the very first time we talked, like, if that, I mean, sorry, if Iron Fist would have just stuck around, that would have been that label coming out to Detroit, oh, yeah. because I remember that DVD, um, I proved, when Marv won, was a, dude, a spit attack, I remember, I was like, yo, who the fuck is that? Like, mind you, like, this is just all compelling now, and it blew my mind out too, but I'm like, damn, you know, like, there's something in that Detroit water, man. Like, they is some scary right. MC. There was so much talent. And, like, Marv wasn't, Marv actually wasn't Iron Fist. But yeah. It was so much talent, of course, in Iron Fist, but the talent around it. Yeah. Like, you guys even had, like, the fat killers around you guys at the time. Yeah. I mean, Mar- oh, See, it, was, it was a lot of things on the table. It was a lot of things on the table. And if, if Cass was fortunate to be able to see certain things from a, a certain standpoint to be able to absorb the information, to absorb the know-how and the relationships, to gain the resources from a bird's eye view looking down, no one was able to really understand what they really wanted from it or what their values were from it. You know, when you see from a certain standpoint of the game, Everybody, you know, want nice things, want to feel stable, but, you know, they can get caught up in different uh, aspects of what the game can bring, man. You know what I'm saying? And it could be from the cut things short, that dangerous. When you're looking at things, you're fortunate to see stuff from a bird's eye view and you develop a fan base on people who follow you in such a manner. When you get the numbers that's going up in reality, you become some sort of voice, you know what I'm saying? And people gravitate towards you and it gets to the point where... Uh, they hang on every word, every move, every make, you know, everything, every make, every move you make, they hang on it. And uh, as soon as you make a, especially in the time with this social media stuff, you have to be careful, you know, because we're in a microwave age. If your morals and your values ain't set right, when you're trying to push a message, it's going to come off real or fake. Yeah. And certain people are dealing with certain things that they're not related to, especially in this day and age. So times change. But I was fortunate to see some things, man, to where you have to push away, you have to be careful, and you know what you're asking for out of this. You know what I'm saying? Right. Really everybody do. was trying. Everybody was trying to find their their way in their place. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. many so many great MCs. You know, it's like Jack from the mud position, kind of from the mud. Yeah, from the mud, straight. You know, everybody trying to get it. And, I mean, that's what. That's what drove me into like producing and just trying to find other things to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was I was I was working on uh, like show promotions, you know, like when the Super Bowl was there. Oh wow! I'm I'm doing the commercials, you know, for Iron Fist and things like that. I still got those commercials too. First, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Remember, oh, man, you party had stuff, man. Remember the party we supposed to have at Bookies? Yeah, yeah, you you know who's behind all that. Yeah, you know <laughs> that's another story. But hey, let's check out though, man. Let, let's put something together to where you know uh, this vision can be shared. You know, and uh, this, this what we saw back then, we can actually share with people now. 
I, I get emails and things from time to time, and people are like, you know, what's up with this? What's up with that? You know, uh, people don't know. It's uh, a full album worth of. Search for Jerry Garcia has videos of almost every song on the album. You know what I'm saying? And it's, it's been time that we got to put this out. But see, yeah, look, look, take it out like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. this, this is the thing. It's videos to every Black Rich Brothers thing. It's, it's videos to these things, man. And see, politics in the game, too. This is what I'm saying. Dealing with resources, dealing with the people in the, in the music industry. It's a two-way. it got to be a two-way street. You know, when the guy asked for what he wanted monetarily, I had that. I offered it, but then he dipped a little bit, you know, fell back because he was doing some other things, too, in the industry. You know what I'm saying? This guy was, you know, film all the Snoop shit. You know, we had the relationship, you know, with other camps and shit in the game. But, you know, it's just stuff all over the place. And we got to pull it back together because nobody really knew or was, they didn't know what to do when it came to this. You know what I'm saying? They really just didn't. And I got sidetracked with that, uh, when you was asking me about the 72nd and Central song. Mm-hmm. That that song, we, re- we finished recording that song at about 4.30 in the morning, I believe. Oh, okay. Those late night studio sessions. Yeah, we were, it was a guy first. I don't remember the dude whose house we was over recording that. that uh, so were you there that day? I'm familiar, I'm familiar. Yeah, we, we, we was all over his house. Uh, we went pick S. Me and Proof went pick S. Man up early in the morning. He the one who did the production on it. And uh, I think Obi Obi showed up to the house that night. But I was staying with my baby mama at that time, right? <laughs> so we, I mean, I wouldn't ain't, ain't like I was just shacking up now. I'm paying my bills. Oh yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. Hey, no, I want to want to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> it was never no situation like that with me, but you know we were t- still together at that time. So you know I had young kids, and they had to get up and and go to uh you know school and daycare that next morning. And she was calling my phone all <laughs> night. Where you at? You need to come. Home. I'm like I cannot come home. <laughs> I think we're working on something that's gonna be great. And I mean I got killed all day all night and just imagine i was about an hour away from my house where we recorded it so having to drive home by the time i get home it's like 5 36 o'clock in the morning as i'm pulling into the house she putting the kids in the car and she taking them to daycare in the school which is what which was what i did every day yeah she she throw them in the car and she stab out of driveway <laughs> speed off and she's so angry at me and I tell my sons that story to this day because they listen to the song, you know, they like it and they hear it. And I'm like, your daddy would have never been on that song if I listened to your mom and came home that night. <laughs> Big bet. That's, that's true that's story. Pocket. But see, fire, man. But see fire. it's like it's certain memories like that too. Like when you actually have like the product like that's finished, like you have something like that that you could tell your kids like that kind of story now too. And those are priceless right. memories. I'm like, it got millions of views. <laughs> but, you know, the kid the kids into the views. They like this your most viewed song, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine. Just imagine. I, I almost left. And came home because I didn't want to deal with the heat. <laughs> <laughs> so glad I didn't. Because look, I'm gonna tell you, Poof, Poof was never gonna babysit nobody. He wasn't gonna come to me and be like, you know, hug me and you got to come on, I'm gonna put you on. You got, you had to be there in the moment. Yeah. You know, Poof. I, like some people know, I don't know if you know, I, I'm a teacher. No, I actually so, don't. Yeah, during that time, I was going. To, I was also trying to go to school to become a teacher and be certified and everything. And when Proof started uh, Iron Fist and see some friends, we had a we had a real talk one day. And he was like, "You know, cuz you only get out of this music game what you put into it." Real and I'm, and I'm listening to him, and he's schooling. He like. I mean, sometimes you got to be prepared to sacrifice not having for what you want. And 
You know, we, we had a real, real deep talk that day because, I mean, I was in the middle of it. You know, I was, I ain't, had, I ain't had no money like that, but I had tons of responsibility at that time. I had two kids. I had a house. I had, you know, a car. We were trying to, you know, growing up, trying to figure out life. An adult life, and, yeah. Yeah, and, and literally, I was a substitute teacher. I went in the building to work on Friday, and I ain't go back. Okay. <laughs> you know, and I, I didn't, I didn't have a real job working, you know, for probably another three or four years. Wow. But luckily, you know, that was, you know, around the time Street Fame and all that stuff. I, you know, I was selling CDs and, you know, doing what I can do and, and was able to make it. He helped me out a little bit, you know, but I had to make, I had to make that decision, you know, Am I going to put full focus on this music right now? Because it ain't no better time than right now. Yeah. It might, you know, it might not be a, a tomorrow, you know. And You're never I'm guaranteed to make five minutes. Right. You know, and I, and, I, and I always thank him for giving me that talk. You know, that talk turned into showing me about publishing and him helping me, you know, get my publishing company set up to where you, you know, be able to get paid from doing music, you know, all of this stuff, I wasn't really schooled on at that time until he broke all of that down, down to me. And you in, know? in a certain situation that you put yourself in in life that you don't realize at the time until after, it's like, whoa, like he put this in my head way before I even knew it. Right. Hey, yeah. Especially in me. Those same, in those same lessons, you know, my son, I tell you, my son making music now, and my son, you know, he started sending me songs when he first started going in. And, you know, I listen and I'm like, you know, this, this music game is a lot. You know, I don't know if I really want to, I don't know if I really want, you know, to do this. And he's going in spending his own money. Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, he, now he's spending his own money and he's making videos. And I'm like, okay, he, he, he really want to do this. So now let me put some of this game on him. You know, let me teach him about make, making sure his, his publishing is correct and understanding this. And, you know, yeah, you got your stuff out through through DistroKid, but check this sound exchange information out I got from my man Ty Ferris in case anybody ever try to, you know, produce some physical copies of your stuff. You always going to make sure you get your money. So now I'm able to share that same information with him. You know, a lot of the older stuff that Proof was giving me, I'm able to get that stuff to my son now. And it's you know, passing it down because he's going to give that to his son after. Right. You know, so yep. you know, that's valuable information. I mean, Proof Sons is making great music right now. Yeah. He's on the Dub Jam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I watch And I watch the sign. I watch the sign. You know, I look at all his, you know, videos, man. He looked like his dad. Yeah. It's, it's just something, man. You know, we, we came up through the infantile stages of this of this music industry. And uh, it's no telling where it's going to go. And, you know, to see right. our, our kids now growing into doing it. I was watching the Fat Father, you know, watching Fat Father interview. And, you know, he got a phenomenal album out right now. Yeah. And his son his son is making music. You know, Oreo out here making music. You know, yeah. I, I think that's great, man. I watched that I watched that from front to back. The whole interview, man. It was dope. <laughs> dope. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's this beautiful thing, man. And it's like even to like see like like even like Nissan like he released um um the without me freestyle I was like yo like what the like this kid has got it <laughs> yeah but like hey I, I I never knew like that was I didn't, I, and look I didn't know back at first Bubba Fat put me on he like yo you heard the sign music I'm like nah and he played me some joints I'm like damn. Dude, you know, he, he, he all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 So, uh, yeah. yeah, man, that's that's great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to link my son up with him, man. See if they can get <laughs> yeah. some. Like, cause, like, definitely, you should. You definitely yeah. should. And he on Def Jam too, so you know, hopefully they go ahead and you know treat him right with the politics they got going on over there. Oh, you know, yeah, right. you def you definitely fully talented with. Now, like, even with you guys, too, because I remember, um, like, I think it's 2005, 
there's an old video of Proof interviewing Fat Folder, like with like an actual interview back then. Now, so I was curious during that time now too. Has any of like First or Jay Hill? Have you guys ever thought about like doing media back then, or like it was strictly focused on the music? Uh, me, I have. Uh, my undergrad degree was in radio, television, communication. So, like, I've always had an interest in the camera and things like that. I mean, even back then with uh, Rap Files magazine with my boy Donnie Armstrong, me and him used to, we used to travel and do, like, all the music conferences, and I would be the person that interviewed everybody for him. A lot of those DVDs are still out here floating around. It's, uh, mm. it's called Rap Files. Uh, so I've always had, you know, interest in things like that. Uh, yeah. I don't know, I first used to carry a camera around. Well, likewise, I went to the Art Institute. And uh, yeah, I went to the Art Institute of Pittsburgh. You know, my my major was in industrial design and special effects. I was more into, you know, special effects, graphic art, and um, actually set building, putting models together, that that sort of thing. I was a little bit ahead on that because here in Detroit, there wasn't really a market for it. I had to be out. So I was in Pittsburgh doing that for a while and I got caught up in the zombie mania thing for a minute, you know, with like the return of the living dead, and night of the living dead. Oh, yeah. yeah, all those guys who uh, did all that stuff, those were my teachers and, and all my you know, people that I did work with low key on shit like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, I love that kind of stuff. I carried the camera a little bit, you know, that uh, anger management stuff, you know, we had cameras for all that, you know, um, all the video work that we did independently, you know, we like to pull other gentlemen and other people who that's their main niche because, you know, just being a jack of all trades, master of none, actually, you know, and that comes in to where I know that I could touch the base with just enough in, 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 in any field to where I know nobody trying to, you know, dupe me or fuck me over because I know what to look for, you know. <laughs> um, that would put you in a certain position to be able to obtain that information. You, you feel what I'm saying? So what he's speaking on is like having that information and passing on is very valuable. In fact, it's priceless. And this is where you get people trying to transcend hip hop into a young man's sport and trying to put a little shame on the elder or the older artists that they came out that stood out. I mean, hell, the greatest artist in the world is pushing 50 right now, two of them, you know, M and Jay Z. Yeah. You know, but M, for the most part, he's still in his game, he's still on top, and he's really just now. He's really just now doing him in a in a in a per se way. You know what I'm saying? So as we get older, you get more vintage, you get more prime, you should be more shined up, more sharpened, and, and being able to put this stuff out and not do it with a sense of embarrassment. You know what I'm saying? So right. I never had. I, I don't have any children then. You know, I don't have any now. That made me a lethal weapon per se, because I was able to just stick to. You know. I had no choice to be with Pete. It wasn't like I had a choice to say, hey, no, I ain't, I ain't hanging out today. Or I ain't going to <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll put up on music till you come out at 7 in the morning. Oh, man, you ain't got to do all that. Tell your line up and pay for it. I mean, you ain't got to do all that. You know what I'm saying? I was very fortunate in that matter. Actually, I've written, I've, I've, I've finished writing one movie's uh, script that I'm trying to shoot in Detroit. I wanted to shoot it this summer, but with things that have been going on with this COVID-19. Oh, yeah. You know, kind of screwed that up, but I got that one finished. I'm halfway through a comedy that I'm writing with a friend of mine, Gary T. Everett. Mm -hmm. And then I just started uh, while I was, you know, sitting here on, on quarantine, I started writing like a scary movie. Okay. Real different shit for me right here. And I'm about 20 minutes into that right now. So that's, that's definitely somewhere where I'm looking to go, you know, along with recording my music and all, you know, I do, I do mostly all my own videos. I film them and edit them myself, you know, cause I'm down here pretty much all by myself. And, and that's the best way to do it. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's why right. you down, you down in Jacksonville right now. Right. How, how, how did it affect down there though, Jay? How, how did it affect if you don't want to jump off the situation for a minute? Did it like shut the city down down there for real, for real in Jacksonville? How did the effects, did you start feeling the effects like from the sickness, riots, the hospitals shut down and things of that nature? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty much here like everywhere else. I actually, uh, I took some great pictures and a little bit of video. The video was kind of shaky because of 
you know, how crazy the situation was. But the first day that they did the protest down here in Jacksonville, I went down there with my camera. And when I tell you I got some great pictures, I'm in the, I'm in the process of editing them right now, and I'm a publisher. Mm-hmm. I got about, I took about 200, I think oh, wow. I took 206 pictures. Okay. So I'm going through them. I think I'm going to end up with about 100 or maybe a little less than 100 real, mm-hmm. real good pictures, man. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to publish it somehow and uh, put it out. I should be dropping a, a little video of me down there within the next week. Just edit that up real quick, like a little two-minute video. Mm-hmm. Just the stuff that was going on down there. But, like, I was literally right in the middle of everything that was popping. I got where they had the line of police in full riot gear with these big-ass machine guns and the protesters right here in their face hurling insults at them. And I'm in between both taking pictures back and forth. Damn. Crazy with big flash hey, you big- going off. <laughs> At my feet and everything, man. It was wild. I salute you on that. You took a big risk. You see how they had arrested the guys from CNN? We yeah. 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 So, yeah, I man. Got, ain't playing. I got some great pictures. There's a, there's an actual video of um, there's a 22 year old. He's just walking home with the cab, and all you see is this police is <laughs> like for no fucking reason. <laughs> That's not what about the uh, what about the result of casualties uh, involved in uh, um, this pandemic? How was the uh, oh uh, yeah for COVID? Hit, the, hit, the the area, hit the area pretty pretty good. Um, I, I'm actually living outside of Jacksonville, so I think we are at about like 250 cases in this area. Oh, shit. But, but you guys are away Jacksonville. from big crowds, though. Yeah, into Jacksonville, you know, they up in the thousands. Oh, damn. Yeah. Yeah, we have like, I think we have like 7,000 cases in my city. Yes, now I won't even go outside. Yeah. Well, I, I will say that uh, here, as far as like, I get my information from a gentleman who I know work in the hospital because I need to see and understand directly from those who hands on with the work, you know. And uh, he said it seems to be slowing up a bit here. He said it's not too many cases on the, you know, where he's at, which was uh, one of the main main stages of this place, you know. So it seems to be slowing down. But as far as the tension rising with other things, it's bringing more. It, it just seemed like the pandemic created a, a environment for this to explode like it did. What you say? Yeah, it's just a ill timing with everything, you know. Shout out, uh, big salute to Lord Josiah, the chief on the front lines of being on there, on the front lines of COVID. Yes, sir, Lord Josiah, sure. Now, um, when you guys are actually, like, when you guys just have, like, regular talks, like, you know, like, when it's not recorded and stuff like that now, too, I was, I was, I was wondering, like, do you guys, like, plan, like, trips to come, like, just to hang out for each other, like, first come down to Florida, or you come back to Detroit, like, or do, is it, like, everything over the internet nowadays between you two? No, only when scheduling allowing, man. Okay. Yeah, we talk, but only when scheduling allowing, we able to get up out of the city or something like that. You know, he also down there with one of our first managers, Joe Collins. Shout out to Joe Collins. He down there in Jacksonville, Florida, too, as well. And I had, you know, shot down there when he first moved down there. So it's my intention, always my intention to be moving around. That that been in my blood. It, it, didn't, it didn't matter. It didn't stop. If I had to be out of town the next day, this is how we were moving. You know, it was right. a level fight that we had to take. Some things just became habit. You know, they say you do things 21 days in a row, it becomes a habit. And we were definitely moving around more than that in 21 days. You know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> yeah. I don't have a problem going out. I say, yeah, it kills. I was on my way out there to go fuck with kills in, in Vegas, you know? There's nothing to go out there and shoot. Yeah, I kill. definitely got to get out that way. I was I was talking to him, uh, what, about four days ago. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, he, 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 posted coast, about, coast. he posted about that earthquake they had out there. Yeah. And then I seen my boy, another one of my boys, Brian, post about an earthquake, and I thought Brian was in Michigan. I'm like, hold the hell up. Is Vegas and Michigan talking Ooh, about flat earthquake? Screen. <laughs> Mr. Flat Screen? Huh? Mr. Flat Screen? Brian? Yeah. And then he like, I'm in Vegas. I'm like, oh, that's what. So y'all in the same spot. That's why uh-huh. y'all go post about the earthquake. So Yeah, that would freak yeah. me out, too. Like, it was like, what the fuck? It's happening on both sides? Yeah, and I gotta get, I gotta go get with kills, man. 
get with him about this camera because he's been into that. You know, I'm brand new. I'm here out there. Shit. I need to haul that kill for some of the models who be shooting. Goddamn. I'll just leave that yeah, at that. Gotta, <laughs> I'm telling you. I, I said, that's yo, another thing. I got to I gotta get with him because I need to be doing the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> I got a sweet ass camera. I got to use this thing. Yeah, definitely. It's all about the shot, though. It's all about that IJ. You know that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now, like, you that money shot. Like, um, even, like, with, like, kills now, too, like, being in photography now, too, and, like, what you guys have evolved now, too, I like to see, like, I mean, sorry, I like to hear what you guys do now, too, like, I want to make my own videos and publish it and then on my own, or I actually want to get my own publishing deal, get my, so it shows that you guys are very, like, you guys are big on ownership, not letting somebody else be the middleman, it's like, oh, I'm taking this percentage, it's like, no, 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 we split it between the people who have to do the work. Yeah, and that's how it should be. You know, when we came up, all everybody ever talked about was getting a deal, getting a deal, getting a deal. You know, I know we were the deal, right? <laughs> yeah, we were the deal, and and that's what and that's the props I give to this younger generation of hip hop. Much more, many more artists are owning their material. Yeah, you know, I talk to my son about that all the time. You know, he's thrown that get a deal out. I'm like, man, you shouldn't even be talking like that right now. I was like, you got the internet. That is your deal. Yeah. You know, you don't need no major label. Yeah. However hard you hustle it is what it's going to turn into. That's right. Your quality, your re the resource, how you approach people. You still got to approach people. You know, when you're reaching out to different people to listen to your stuff, it's about how you break the ice sometimes. The yeah, name I mean, of the game is exposure. The name of the game is exposure. It's about who you're exposing your craft to. And, you know, if you've got the market and, you know, your fan base, then, of course, you can cater to it. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, but not when they're too busy trying to flash money and their message is different. You know, it's about holes, money, holes, and lean and shit like that, bro. So, you know, certain things just have to come to a head when it's about putting this message out. And the quality is always there when you've got paper behind it. But at the same time, what are you putting in the atmosphere? What are you putting out? That's going to create a wave for other shit. You know, when people were doing pill, popping purple pills and shit, that was one of the joints that niggas hated the most, really. But right. look at the wave. Look at the wave. You know what I'm saying? It, yeah. it turned. It didn't say that. Not to say that that was responsible for it. But, you know, you would have some sort of moral aptitude about it when you see the level of uh, pharmaceutical drugs and the kids that strung out on these type of things going on at this moment. You, you somewhere in your heart and your mind, you say, "Look, I gotta be an active towards this shit." Because back then we was young, we was fucking around doing whatever, however. But now it's a level of responsibility that must come along with this. That's all you know. That's all I, how I feel about this art, this craft, because it's a reflection of you. And that's why people always talk about keeping it real. And you know they say so much in their raps, and then they fuck around and use that in a court of law against them. You know, it was it was going on then too. You know, it's not just now. We heard about the artists nowadays that's out they they say so much in their art. How do you feel about that, Jay Hill, as far as what they say, uh the level of realness and that quality of their music? Um first I'll say I definitely understand, you know, the younger generation with a lot of the verbiage and a lot of the, the subject matter that they use in their songs because I mean they are young. And they out and they out here, you know, doing some wild things. Just like when I was that age, I, I I talked about a lot of stuff in my music that you probably wouldn't hear me talk about right now. So I think we do have to be accepting of these guys, and you know, when it's their time. But at the same time, it is incumbent upon us to be able to, you know, to school them guys and be like, hey, yo, you know. You might not want to be saying X, Y, Z, yeah. you know, if you're going to be out here implicating yourself in something that might get you in trouble. And then you or, go back on it. Right. Or if if you got these songs about, you know, these this, this certain subject matter, throw some throw some of this in there, too. Yeah. You know, you got you got the ear of your generation. So you have to learn to become somewhat responsible and what you say and what you give them every day because rap music is highly influential. Yeah. I was crazily influenced by stuff that Ice Cube and 
Easy E and the Ghetto Boys were were rapping about back in the day. So I know how a young kid feel sitting in his car, hanging out with his friends, listening to this music. So if 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 you give him a bunch of that message, then you need to also take time to give you know a little bit of this other message. And as far as rappers in my generation go, I think that's your way to longevity. Yeah, it is. It is. So that's why. You know, now with the music that I put out, the message is is totally different. You know, and I'm not going to be this, I'm not going to put out every album where I'm Jesus, Jesus, preachy, preachy. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. You know what I mean? But I do understand the responsibility that I have as an MC, you know, of my era. And as I say, this can be a way to longevity for rappers that came from our era. It ain't like you get older and you forget how to rap. <laughs> if anything, to me, you know, I've gotten better. Well, you know, even so, with tracks like Young Black Male, it's a prime example of what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I mean, and, and things like that, you know, and I, I, I recently had put my a new studio together and, you know, to now where I'm able to make a high, get a high quality sound from right here in my house and also be able to immediately mix it master it and put it out right away to the public. So now that I can do that, I'm like, you know, I got to say something. I can't just make party and bullshit music all the time. Oh, yeah, so no. I made the young black male and I made the uh, stay humble, uh, stay foolish, stay hungry, stay foolish. You know, those were the two first songs that I made when I put my new studio together, back together. So I just put them out as singles. You know, I didn't know I was going to catch this wave and get so hot and been recording all the music I have. So, oh, February come around, I'm like, you know, I got a lot of songs that I've been working on speaking about relationships. Hell, let's, let me put out a February 14th out. You know, it might be it might be some people out here going through things in their relationship that I didn't been through. I done been through the gamut of it. I, I got a huge understanding of everything. <laughs> yeah. let's, let's put that out there. Nah, shit, let my son and hear this. You know, they might not run into some of the situations that I ended up running into. You know, and, uh, you know, after that, all of this social unrest popped off. I was in the middle of making an album that, you know, Griselda's bringing back, you know, that grimy hip-hop beat. That '90s sound, that grimy yeah, that '90s sound. So that's that's where I started with this new album. I got some, I got, I got some joints, you know, just with that grimy hip hop '90s sound. No case, yes old. sir. Yeah, and I'm giving that old, that old flow, that old smooth flow, and that turned into the '87 Celtics. Okay. When I made the '87 Celtics song, it was actually going to be the last song that I was recording for that EP and I was going to release it and I put up a post about should I release it or should I keep recording on on Instagram I believe and V Styles I don't know if you know V Styles Uh, one of my uh, season two guests shout out to Mr. V Styles so so V Styles came in and said you know what Jay you need to just keep recording because the more you keep recording you know, the more you're going to get back into it and the better material you're going to make. You're going to make. And then that bled into me making more of this like revolution music that, that's on this new album that I'm making. And I'm like, yo, that 87 Celtics, that can be the single. Since I didn't made a sweet video for it, put that out. <laughs> I need to make five or six more songs like this and make it its own project. So that's what I'm that's what I'm working on finishing up right now. So like I said, I think I, I got to make at least about maybe one more song. And I'll have a finish. I have seven songs, a uh, finished EP, and I just got to name it. <laughs> See, like, um, I like how you put that on Facebook now, too. I don't know if you could hear us first. First, just join us now. When you put on Facebook that you were in the middle of writing your magnum opus now, too, and when I was, like, hearing, like, some of your past work now, too, I was like, you know, I, I admire artists who don't give up because you, you could have easily just gave up after, like, not getting their uh, recept- uh, reception that you wanted. It's like, you know what? 
I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I'm going to fall back. But you keep pushing. And it's like what uh, Proof used to tell you, too. You get what you put in now, too. So I believe, like, we're in a day and age now, too, where people are actually listening to the lyrics. Like, they're not... Yeah, they listen to the beat. But we actually have people listening to the lyrics again now, too, which is the most important part of it. So I think right. that when you release this, like, it's going to get, like, a very good reception because look at all the good reception from the albums coming out of Detroit. Um, Ken Farler... Uh, Miss Corona's The Virus, uh, The Allegory, uh, Tia Price in China. Yep. Uh, gr- it's a great time. Like, I also made it uh, a status, it's never been a greater time to rhyme. Yeah. And I, and, I really, and I really feel like that. Like, when I sit down in here in my studio, and, you know, I, like I, I've been telling I told you my process, you know, I've been doing the, the beat first. And then when I sit down and write it, it just it just flies off onto the paper, like with no effort. <laughs> yeah. But then when I when I when I record it and I go back and listen, it's so complex. But I didn't put it didn't take extra effort. Like erase that. No, let's. It just flowed out of me, and and part of me want to keep on recording, you know. But I want I want to put this project out. First of all, I don't want nobody to steal my subject matters that I've been talking about. <laughs> you know, people First you know what happens. Because rappers are rappers, you know, and somebody come out with something, it's happened on a few albums that have just recently dropped where I'm like, damn, I, just, I, I gotta change this. You know, so I wanna put I just wanna put it out. You know, I think seven seven is a good number. Yeah. You know, and I think from now on anything I'll ever release will be in small pieces like that. Because I'm I'm so into these to themed albums right now. Yo, first over here with the... <laughs> I don't know if you see it. I'm not laughing at you, Jimmy Hill. I'm laughing at I don't know if you see what first was doing on the camera. <laughs> Yo, first, can you show him the drum again? <laughs> My new drum is thing. I'm in a beat battle. Of... I'm in the middle trying to do <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, man. <laughs> um, so you said like early on during the interview, like you made, um, I think you made a beat on one of Ferris's drum machines now too. So first, you had drum machines. So uh, were they just for protection value, or were you trying to get into the production game too? Hey, man, I've been doing things for a minute, low-key. I put a couple things together and just, you know, throw it to somebody and let them do whatever they want to do with it. Hey, Jay Hill, didn't I send you something not too long ago and ask you if you knew that I had did that? Yeah, in the email. Yeah, and how I found out about that, you know, because, you know, the game is dirty, man. You know, you can go with somebody crib, you know, something. Hey, man, say that for me. I'll be back for it, you know what I'm saying? Oh, ain't no problem. You can hear it somewhere else. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you never knew. You never knew, right? Yeah. And then if I say something about it, then I'm hating or I'm spending venom on somebody. You see what I'm saying? This game is fickle. But then when you see somebody like King Gordy and Bizarre on stage rapping to your shit and the crowd going wild, and they didn't know you did it until you approach them like, damn, that was dope. I'm not looking for no money. You know what I'm saying? But you didn't know I did that. Yeah. That shit was funny. That shit was fire. And that's the best that's the best reward I could see coming out of it, you know what I'm saying? Out of something like that of that nature. But uh yeah, I like to play with the drum machine from time to time, you know. Okay. See like you know I like how like you like your involvement too with Fat Ray with his upcoming with his upcoming work now too, because like I gotta give yeah. it to you first. Fat Ray, man. Fat Ray, Fat Ray that's my guy. <laughs> I gotta yeah, give that's it my to guy, you. Man. Th- this yeah. guy first he really made me like understand Hex's humor because from an outsider, <laughs> from an outsider, I didn't get it right. So I'm like, why is this guy saying he hates you know, all this, all this, all this, all this shit, right? So I remember Hex is different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, I'll, I'll message Hex. I'll message Hex something like, "Yo, like I sent Hex my uh, 87 seconds Celtics video. Hex is sending you some shit back, like." Fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that's when you know your shit fire. Yeah. Like, yeah, but he mean it in when, a loving way, though. Yeah. 
Like, and you actually really have to understand, like, that humor now, too. Because I remember, like, the very first time I messaged him now, too. And he's like, uh, you're going to need to haul. He put the monkey emojis now, too. I'm like, I don't know how to respond to this, man. Like, I'm, I'm going to just leave it at that. I'm like, positive vibes. That is positive vibes. I'm like, oh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah. Me and Hex got some wild DMs. You got you to gotta know Hex. Yeah. Well, well, because, like, first, first was the one to really put it into perspective for me, right? Because, um... Hex used to always walk around and watch people on stage, and if he didn't give you that mean ass look, yo, your ass was out of here. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember performing like I had a show at uh, St. Andrews, you know, upstairs, you know, on the big stage, and I had just made this this song. It was it was called uh, I think it was called Club Don't Stop. That was on the B sides, and uh, was it? I don't, I don't know where it was. I think it was on that. But I had never performed it in front of anybody. That's what it was. I, it was my first time ever performing a song. So, of course, you want to, you know, get people's reactions. But the one main person who I made sure I was looking at while I was on stage performing, I'm glancing off to the side to see what Hex's facial expression is going to be. And he had this. He had, you know, he had a squeeze bottle, his little headband on. And he gave, and he gave me. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, my shit bang. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, my shit bang. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, because when you get that man, approval man, from Hex, oh, you official. So, hey, right. any, anybody get on here from the D and they really got no thoroughbred something to say about Hex, man, I don't know what they doing in the D. Yeah. Facts. That's facts right there. I met Hex outside of music. Okay. Yeah, me too. I, met, I met Hex at I met Hex at Softball City after a softball game. They was all sitting together, you know, we used to drink beer and all that after softball games. And the group he was sitting with, they was all sitting around listening to music. It was some local Detroit music. I'm like, let me pull up right here. I'm like, hey man, you know, check my shit. He was playing the dreadnoughts. Oh my god, yes yeah. sir. He was playing some dreadnoughts. And uh, I'm like, that's dope. I'm like, you know, I got some joints too. Check check my shit out. So I put my eyes in, you know, he, he listened to it. He liked that. We exchanged numbers. That's how I met Hex. Okay. Yeah, then, you know, then we would see each other, you know, on the scene. But the first time I ever met Hex was on 8 Mile at Softball, at Softball City. See, and like when you meet somebody outside of music, and then you see him like when you do music, it, it, it's different. It's like, oh, I, I know you before music. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Damn. He said he left the dreadnoughts. I wonder if Alias P. Knuckle Slaughter were there, too. Shout out to my guys right there. Alias P. Yeah. I actually, uh, Mr. Hill, um, I actually did a six part series on the dreadnoughts, too. And uh, I, I think it's some of my best work now, too. But I got all the dreadnoughts, told the whole story. And it's over eight hours, but it's it's really a phenomenal piece of work. I got to check yeah, that. It, it was Hex. It was Hex that introduced me to Cobb. It took me over to Cobb and introduced me to the other side of the X Fam. You know, the Tinksters and shit. Where we end up bumping up with Jimmy Hoffa. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh -huh. you know, that's where you know the Tinksters were one fat killers. Rest all in them peace. All. Rest in peace to Cobb. Peace, man. Rest in peace, bro. Most definitely. You know, that's where I met Luco at. You know, see, rest in peace. And the brothers yeah, all Luko. came. Solidarity back then too. I would say, as much as we was always talking about somebody hating on us, we was sold up. We was tight, even <laughs> if we didn't like each other. We respected each other. So yeah. I look at the game. Our times done changed. Different man. It's it's wild, man. It's crazy looking back on what you had, what you seen, what you was doing on the end, and be like, man, we was there. We was oh there. yeah. You know. What I mean? So shout out to everybody to come after us. Those you know who we may have influenced from moving down the line because you did see. A lot of uh, four men groups start spinning out, you know what I'm saying, things of that nature. And, you know, whether people want to admit it or not, because this is what you have to do in the game to always pay homage to those that came before you. That gives you class. That gives you respect. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's yeah. respect. That's respect earned. Everything is earned, not given. You know, and the harder it takes for you to get to where you got to go, the more you can hold on to it, the more you appreciate it and maintain it. You know what I'm saying? Because some people, it is you can get somewhere overnight, and it seems like it's an overnight success, but at the end of the day, you just drop into a pool of piranha, and then now what you're supposed to do then? Yeah. But it starts seeing somebody 
fuck me over at the end or somebody owe me some money because it didn't have that knowledge off the rip. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, the brothers can get it together. We can all get it together in this game. <laughs> yeah. you know? Well, even like within like Detroit now too, it's more unified than I see now too as opposed to what it was like 10 years. Mind you, I never seen it 10 years ago, but like from now, I see a lot more Detroit artists collaborating with each other, showing love to each other, posting about each other now too. And, but, see, and that's what needs to be done. You know, that type of uh, energy to be pushed out in that direction. You know what I'm saying? And showing the solidarity and unification of artists because we already been had a black cloud over our head. You know what I'm saying? And we operate and we run through it for the years. It's been over... 25 years with this cloud and we still run through it man whether they want to get Detroit this respect or not it's a Detroit motherfucker in every part of the world making something happen and, you know? I, and I even notice now too like even when people move away from Detroit they'll still rep that city like they're in it like Mark Sarks Carol's and Jay Hill yeah absolutely you can't, absolutely. You can't get the Detroit out you, you know <laughs> so and you so you proud know, it's hard, from to, you know, it's hard to overlook great talent that, that, serve, that come from harsh circumstances like, you know, the environment of Detroit. It, there are environments everywhere in the world, but to be able to strive through it and to come through with it without having the same um, industry that, say, a New York has, say, that L.A. has, say, that um, now at Atlanta, you know, because we don't went through our plights with them as well, where they claim to be the next Motown, you know, but there's always an open open bridge to these cities, you know what I'm saying? And yeah. that's due to another Detroit character there in those cities too that's offering that because we didn't have that type of industry here, you know? Everything is coming from the mud. It had to go somewhere. Even him, he had to go, you know, not had to go, but yeah. it was an L.A. pack, Dr. Really Dre. did, though, before they accepted him. That was the, that was the black guy on Detroit. And okay. then you had 50 Nobody cents. accepts you until you go somewhere else and they say you're great and then Okay. Get that cosign. He's great. Well, yeah, we, we don't need no cosign. Yeah, because you got never, it's a talent. Played. Like a cosign is different. But see, it's, think it's that attitude right there, too, to a degree of not needing, always saying what we don't, but what we always, what we should put on the table is what we can produce and what we do need. You know, see, this, this manhood of I don't need, I do this all by myself type of thing that's, you know, in the game. Not saying that, you know, it should be. Um, uh, was demasculated anything of that nature and I'm not saying that I'm saying that people need to be a little bit more understanding that it takes team value when you're talking about doing something of that magnitude you not know one person on the internet think or have the idea of thinking like a soldier boy I was on the internet I blew up off of that true indeed but without those receptors those people who was receptive to that it wouldn't have happened yeah. You're not just doing, it. you know what I'm saying? You're not just, oh, I'm doing this, and that's what it is. Because then when you enter into that environment of an um, a industry environment, then you get a muscle put on you, you know, a muscle. They don't want you to say certain things. Yeah. They try to get you to say certain things. And they push you in the direction of controversy or something of that nature, you know what I'm saying? But you have to understand how to navigate through these things. You know, you don't have to put the dress on. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but there, there's things that you... There's things that you have to do when you maintain it. I've I, I seen that shit, bro. I'm not going to fall into the same category as these other guys talking about conspiracy theories and Hollywood this, Hollywood that. You know, I've seen the shit, bro. And I was fortunate enough to see that shit in advance to where I'm like, I'm not scratching to get in fighting to kick, you know, to get to Hollywood and those shit. Yeah. You know, I'd rather just meet the individuals who had the same values and core, you know, core values and, 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 and morals that what we can do some work together. If we talk about doing video, then let me holler at one of my guys I know who got a nice long resume who has the same core values with us. But if you want to put a value, if you want to put a, a label on it, let's say Vice TV or any of those other type of um, uh, networks that people aim towards. We can get you there, you know, but it, it takes steps. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? To get you to there. And plus you got to be shined up polished. You know, a lot of things where artists are able to wake up and be in the studio, you have a, a point of, you know, people oversaturating. It's good to get that shit off your chest, but then you have to do quality control with your music as well. Oh, you know yeah. what I'm saying? First impression is a impression in any type of environment, any type of social structure. First impression. You're going to put something out, you got to reinvent yourself, and that's the deal with the internet. You're able to take your profile and be whoever you want to be with. 
if that's the case. If, if money is your only drive, then you can do it over the internet and obtain that. But that, that's got to be, you got to stick to that and this just be that, you know? Now, if you put out this uh, this image of being such a gangster and you don't think no one's going to want to book you and test you, then it's going to be a problem there too because you got to come correct with what you're with. You know what I'm saying? We, we have to pay homage and look those who came before us, the stories that happened on the road and things, so those stuff, those things still occur. Yeah. You don't want to be out with a tough guy and, and get a book for show. These motherfuckers are paying you twenty, thirty thousand for you and bring you somewhere and then rob you, possibly make an example of you just for internet fame. If you know things that stuff had occurred. You know, so it you have to have people in your corner, people of certain stature and, and, and respect. People who got the know-how to navigate through. If you're a young artist to maneuver through this, if you want to be successful and have longevity in the game, you know. Other than that, you just be a, a straight, straight sheep out here moving around, taking drugs, damn near overdosing, you know, because drugs pay a, a big, uh, a big. It, it, it's sad that it plays a big part in the industry of music and entertainment. Yeah, you know, it, it's not just that age. Thing. It's music and entertainment, you know, how people move. If you're moving at light speed and you need, if you done made it to a point to where you uh, got to be in New York, L.A., Chicago, and these different time zones, then unfortunately you may succumb to some sort of um, chemical help to go to sleep, let's say, sleeping pill. Let's say you got to pop something to get fired because you got to go sit in front of a camera on a show that's really detrimental to your, your environment, to your image. Yeah, to your image. People have a different respect for when they would be on, say, uh, let's say, be for real. This is the dust of low. We here on ground floor. We're growing together. We understand where it starts from. But there's individuals out there who will look down on this as just being what it is, a podcast, blah, 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 because they're now doing um, the Today Show or Jimmy Fallon <laughs> or some of that nature. You, you see what I'm saying? Right. So these people, moral aptitude is twisted in the in per se. So when you got someone that's not guiding you in the right sense of a manager who just want to feed you these pills, go to sleep, feed you this pill, get up. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Put that's you in front of the camera. You know, these, you know what I'm saying? It, it, things happen. But when you and you become an artist of substantial size, then this is when they start trimming the fat around people like that for control. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, this game is something else. And you just want to maintain control maintain control of your message and control of who you are. You know, that's basically it. Till you're doing you, you know what I'm saying? But have have a, a real um, game plan about what you want to do and just set it in motion, man. You know what I'm saying? That's my thing with artists today. Set it in motion. You know, we know the fire is there. You know, the wheel and drive is there. But make sure it's valuable, man, because as soon as they see, you know, your shit, they're like, I just want my master. That shit don't even matter. It, yeah. don't matter. it never did. You know, it's about licensing things and making things happen in the way that you know that you can make it happen for yourself and make sure you collect your percentages and know what you want. Know, know your self-value. Know your self-worth. You know, my first show was a thousand dollars, man. My first paid show, thousand dollars over to Wu Tang and Shane Park. Damn, you're always better than fifty. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That, yeah, I can't that, remember what I got paid. I probably didn't get paid. <laughs> that, that, that set my standard, though. You know yeah. what I'm saying? I knew if people that wasn't fucking with me on certain levels, then I, it's just all money ain't good money. You feel me? That's so, true. You got to acquire and, and, and put your energy into other things. And that's what, like, driving me today, you know, dealing with dust and low, from the dust and low, man. I, this right here and, and saying that, you know, Jay Hill, this is history here in the making. Here's history of part of history that people I see and know, they don't acknowledge to the extent to where they're supposed to be at. And we get that. It's a lot of things that need to be set into perspective, set into motion to where, you know, full stories can continue to come out. People can still live because none of our homies who passed on, Jay Dilla, MC Bree, I'm talking about by 10, you know, uh, proof and, you know, all day. This is my breath all day. Um, that we should be able to put our people's names out here and keep them out here and living because the art is what makes us yeah. infinite. It's what art, makes the us art, the art going to live forever. Yeah. Forever. And like, 
when like I have to like sometimes like tell myself this too because I was fans of you guys before all this now too. Like I remember I used to always watch interviews before I was doing this. I remember I used to watch old Iron Fist interviews, old Proof interviews, old Jay Dilla interviews. And I was mm-hmm. like, why is no one covering like somebody like a firstborn or like a Ty Ferris or like a super MC to the extent like of where they're covering these artists? And then right. when I really started to evolve this podcast, I started to reach out to them and cover these people now too. Like everybody that you guys said, I covered already, except for Boldy. But but like V Styles. I never knew V Styles got shot in the head and survived it until he came on the cast and told me. So it's like certain history that it's documented on the show. Like the fa- like for uh Marv One when he came on the show talking about like that clip of Jerry Garcia. I for for from an outside perspective, I thought he was in Iron, Iron Fist, but it's like what you said, Jay Hill. There's other people around Iron Fist at the time. But that love was there, though. That love was there. Yeah. You know it was called extended. It was called extended family. Yes, X Fam for sure. Yeah, X Fam. I was almost. I was, was going to say Philly. Yeah, it's a song called X Fam. Okay, is it out for the public? Yeah. What what yeah. album was was that on? It was me, Mark One. Actually, it's on electric Kool-Aid acid testing, right? The vinyl? Yeah, I think it might have been electric Kool-Aid acid testing. Because you and Pete did Rap Life on there too, right? Oh, yeah. Y'all, we did Rap Life. Life. We did, uh, what was Do You On? We didn't well, ever put that out, too. Man, doggy. It, it, it's a couple of versions of that, but it's on, <laughs> it's on YouTube and all it's that. People, YouTube. Yeah, I know it's out on YouTube. Yeah, people put it out, but we never really like The song, the song. I still fuck with Do too, to this day. The song X Fam was King Gordy, Marv One, me, Miss Mr. Wrong, which is yeah. used to be Beretta, and uh, I think one more person was on that song. But that song is it's on it's on YouTube. Oh, I'm gonna check that out after. I ain't gonna fret. I just wrote it down. Family, extended family. Yeah. Oh wait, yeah. extended family. You know, actually, I think I do have that, Joe. I just have to, I have, a, I have a lot of underground Detroit. I have, like, Frank and Dank 48 hours in my MP3, so I probably got it, and I just have to go find it. Hey, J. Hill, t- uh, tell me this, man. Was, was uh, it sick notes where we might have bumped into each other at? Um, I don't know. Could have been. Sick notes was legendary production. It still is, but you know. We used to be over there heavy too. Well, I was I actually going to ask you I guys. got a cold. I got a cold song. Yeah. Wait a minute. It's a, I got a song with Sig- Signals produced one of the songs on 67 Riots. Okay. I believe it's called, the song is called Signals. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually named after him too? Yeah. For yeah. See, see, like, um, well, I the reason why. I forget what song's been on what. But if not, that's going to be one of the songs that I. That would have probably been on Street Fame too. If I didn't put it on the '67 Riots, then I never put it out. I got it here. Okay. So I think I, I think I did put that song on the '67 Riots. Now, because you guys like, um, you guys obviously been to like crazy amount of shows in your lifetime now too, and probably seen like a lot of fucked up shit in your lifetime at a crazy show now too. Uh, I remember when it first told me like the whole Killer Khan fight they had in uh, Vegas or something like that. She was hilarious right there. Um, so as for you, Jay Hill, do you have any like standout <laughs> memories where first I just like you know always bring back memories to you? It's like damn, yo, that was wild that night. From a show. Oh, it doesn't even hey, have man. to be from a show. Oh, hey man, it's still so good, man. Cause why is it always you know saying attached to stuff like this, man? You know. What I mean? <laughs> Oh, you're uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, Nothing incriminating, of course. Ed Legend. Yeah, right. Think We're not Vlad. I don't want to be Vlad or Adam 22. Oh, Let's get no. that right. I don't think it was a good one. Yeah. Oh, okay. The funny, one of the most hilarious, I'll give a funny moment. One of the most hilarious moments ever at a show was King Gordy. We were at the Majestic. <clears throat> and something was going wrong with the audio. But King Gordy used to have this intro to his show. I was performing right after King Gordy. So I was standing, you know, on the side 
of the stage, you know, backstage area. So King Gordy had this huge intro he used to do before his shows. Uh, something, something, when I was young, I would be Van Dyck and Harper, the east side of the D. <laughs> and then he would, end it, he would end it saying, and I was King. <laughs> and then his music was supposed to drop, right? So he did the whole thing, and I was king. And the music didn't drop. So they went, they went, you know, over the mic board, whatever, whatever they got to do, it's trying to get stuff fixed off. So Gordy starts again, and I can hop the east side of the D, and I was king. And the music didn't drop again. <laughs> Gave him one more chance. He goes through the whole spiel. The east side of the D, and I was king. He turned around and it didn't drop. He was like, "Fuck it, I'm not performing." I will never forget. I tell him that story all the time. And another thing about King Gordy. King Gordy was supposed to say the hook on my knockers, not proof. Oh, really? Yes. That's 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 about this. I waited for King Gordy's ass on 8 Mile and 75 before I made the shot because I used to record at the studio uh, my boy Teddy Dutton. I forget the name of his, but he used to be in a, in a popular group that had a little quick run for a minute and stole a lot of records. I used to record sometimes over Teddy Dudley's house, and that's for me and Proof recording my knockers. But I had called for a I mean, murder told him I needed Gordy because I knew that I knew that hook needed a big voice. You know, I didn't my, my style wasn't really you know big voice like that, so I wanted Gordy to do it. And they like bet, all right, you know, we're gonna put it together. First, tell me, no, I meant not first. Uh, Hex, tell me, no, we're we going to meet up over here, and then we'll shoot down to the studio. I waited for an hour and a half for his ass. <laughs> Never showed up. Called the hell out of Hex. Couldn't get in touch with none of them. Turns out something happened, you know, where he wasn't able to make it. But he was going to be the one on that hook. And then I eventually was like, you know what? Me and Pete, I was letting Pete hear the song. He was like, man, let's do that. Me and him hit the studio and we end up knocking it out. But that was supposed to be Gordy on that. Damn. Yeah, the Kenneth yep. Van Dyke, yo, he a wild man. I ain't gonna front. He a wild man. He was man. supposed to be on my knockers. So, yeah, like, well. um, you were, like, having, like, like you said, like, a very deep history within Detroit with it, and we're having a good relationship with the artist now, too. Who's a Detroit artist that you want to work with but still haven't worked with? Uh... A few, but let me let me let me let me make sure I hit this right. Okay. A person who I haven't worked with and who I really don't even know that well is Apollo Brown. Oh wow! Okay. I, I actually sent him a message. Uh, I haven't heard back from him yet, but I would I would love to work with Apollo Brown. I'm a big fan of his sound. I think he dope. Uh, Sincerely, Detroit. That. Oh, love that album. Yeah, I told him that in his message. I hate I wasn't on that record. That record is phenomenal. Uh, I've never did a song with Fat Father. Okay. Even though me and him is super cool, he's actually going to play a role in the movie that I was telling you about. Yes. I wrote When I wrote the movie, I wrote the name of the character is Fats because I wrote it after him. He, Fats is hilarious. Yeah, Shabazz is the comedian. Oh, shit. Like, he should be in Hollywood making millions and millions of dollars. You know what I mean? In films. Like, he hilarious. But yeah, some of the things I he posts on Instagram. Oh, shit. Yeah, definitely uh, would love to do a, a song with Fats. Uh, okay. Just off the top of the brain right now, though. Those two. Okay. Bro, that's one hell of a good two right there. Damn, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine, like, J. Hill and Fat Folder over Apollo Brown production. I'm put it into, put into the existence of crazy. speakers. That'd be crazy. Production, now production. Foul mouth. Ooh. Uh, who else? Yeah, foul, foul got some crazy. Five mile, me, and, me and Five Mile gonna happen. I've been talking to Pat. That's gonna happen. Okay, okay. That's definitely gonna happen. You already, you already work with Merch Music. 
Okay. Oh, first, yeah, definitely, definitely got joints with uh, my suit. That's my guy. Do you have joints with uh, Shimmy Bango, uh, J-Hill? Uh, yeah. I see him. And him actually, he actually produced a song on uh, my February 14th album, too. Okay. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry, my bad, Bane. I forgot the name change. Bane Belushi. It's no more Shimmy Bango. My bad, Bane. Oh, Shimmy Bango? That's it. <laughs> Um, so like when, when you're like actually like say like uh, thinking production wise too, um, for your upcoming album now too that you're working on now too, um, is it gonna feature your production or is it gonna feature others' production? I did this whole album myself. Oh wow, okay. So you you yeah. doing like an allegory type of thing where you doing the rhymes and the beats? Yeah, I did. I did the whole joint myself. Uh, I got I got some stuff from some people uh, that's dope, but. And I was like over halfway done with it. I was like, man, this would be kind of cold if I could just pull it off by myself. Yeah. So, yeah, I, and I had, and the thing about it is I had just made a beat CD. I, I did like about uh, 18 beats uh, on a beat CD. And I promised myself that I wouldn't touch none of those beats because every time I got a history of every time I make a beat that's just cold, I immediately make the song. It's like, I've, yeah, and, you know, I've I've always said, you know, I just want to make some beats and just shop them out to people and not touch them. So I told my wife, I was like, I am not touching none of these beats. I sent some to Bodie. Uh, I sent some to Ty Ferris. Okay. I sent some to uh, I sent it to a few people. I even I even been reaching out to a lot of these young guys in the game. Uh, you know, they do what people call bag rap. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know what I mean? But, you know, I don't make that kind of music, but that don't mean I don't listen to it and don't respect it. Oh, yeah. You know, like, you can right, listen so to it and respect it. doesn't mean you do. Yeah. I mean, uh, Eastside Peasy, uh, Rio, the young OG from Flint. Okay. I think it's dope. T. Uh, Grizzly. Grizzly, I, never, I haven't had any interactions with him, but, of course, you know, he, he definitely get his respect out here. Now, Kid Vicious. Uh, young, young, young kid, uh, All-Star all JR. These are people who, who I've been sending production mm -hmm. to you know, that, I, that I'm trying to work with. Okay. Young JR, um, is that the gent from Slum Village? No, Young JR. Uh, no, no, no. That's, that's young RJ, RJ, my bad. I'm thinking of somebody else. My bad. That's RJ. Yeah. yeah. My RJ bad. Dope too. I never recorded but it's RJ. Too, it's I always, always loved RJ's. Production. I would love to do something over RJ. You, you talking about RJ from Sun Village though, young RJ from Sun yeah, Village, right? Yeah, yes. but the kid I'm okay. talking about is because it's kid another one. All Star Jr. Yeah, but young it's another G. producer. It's another producer I'll call Young RJ too as well. Oh, he got, okay. Yeah, he got, he got a lot of production out on the majors too right now too. Man. Yeah, he does out. actually. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah that's but uh, you know, shit out there. I wanted to. I just wanted to put this one out myself. You know, even the other the other EP that I said I had started to work on. That's all my production too. But okay. after this, I want to record over some other people's beats. See, I think now too, like um, once you release this body of work and people actually hear it, like they'll hear the production, and you may never know. Like people may just start hitting you up for production after that. I'm like, yo, who did this beats? I did the beats. Yeah, that'd be dope too, you know. So I'm here. I got a lot of work. I've been I've been working. I got I got like four one terabyte hard drives sitting in there. I got two oh damn one terabyte down. But those my those reserved. I'm about to fill them up. I got a full one in here. I'm about to take out, and I got another one that's about half full. So I've been working. Okay. Now got, have you have you been work Have you been reaching out to any guys outside of uh, Detroit? A few, man, and actually, I've never ever been one to like message. I didn't even know that you could do it. Like, you can message people, you know, like on Instagram. Yeah, like direct. Like, yeah, like they might not see it. You know, I'm sure they get millions of messages, but I've actually got hit hit back by a few people. You know, over this over this uh, quarantine. Yeah, absolutely. Got so, time to sit their ass down now. Right. <laughs> yeah. well, I have actually had a chance to sit down and at least check stuff out. You know, I, I've been hit back by uh, cats. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Musa. The Musa lady? I covered that guy, too. 
Yeah, yeah. Like, that's my guy. And, 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 I, I, and I know, 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 and I I love them guys music, man. I would love to work with them. Uh, uh, they got specific styles. Like I sent, I sent Mussolini some joints, and he was like, "You know, this is dope, but I need, I need to be a little slower." We, you know what I'm saying? Um, so um, you were saying before we cut out now too. Um, you were naming some of the names in the underground now too. Has any of them got back to you, or you don't want to uh, give that information out yet? Yeah. I, uh, of, of which one? Of which guys? Oh, like uh, maybe like a Mussolini or Ito. Yeah, Mussolini. Yeah, Mussolini have had correspondence back and forth. I sent him some. I sent him some joint. He liked. He liked the joint I sent him, but he said it was too fast. You know, he got a certain style. Yeah. All his stuff got that smooth melodic. So I went back in. You know, cooked up a couple. I actually sent him some recently. I ain't, I ain't heard back from him about those, but okay. Once I'm done with my album, I got some samples. You know that I've that I've set aside that I think them guys might like uh, even for Bodie, you know, because it's kind of similar. And uh, I'm gonna really dig in on making that production and trying to get those, you know, off to some of them guys. Okay, see, and like it's even good to hear, like I'm like because like what producers, they're like they're very their ears are more uh, advanced than the average listener now too. And also, you may make a beat like. I don't want to give this to anybody. Like, there's some producers out there. I'm not saying all, oh, but there's some producers that would make the beat. Like, I'm not giving this to anybody. Like, and this I'm is like, fine. And I'm like that because <laughs> first of all, first of all, I rap, and I damn near be wanting to rap over it myself. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm like, he's like, I got a joint right now. It's for a female rapper. It's called Sugar Daddy, but. I'm trying to give it to specific people. Like, I shot it out to this one female rapper. Uh, I don't say her name. I really don't mind saying, but I ain't, I ain't gonna say her name. Yeah. But she hit. She hit me back more on some. Well, I I do features. Like, you know, I, I sell features for money. You know, and I'm like, <laughs> well, fuck, I'm, I'm trying to give you a a track for free. Yeah. All, I was, all, all I want to do is do the paperwork and make sure we good on the back end. But this, this some fire right here. I'm giving you some shit. Don't hit me back talking about. I do features. <laughs> money. I didn't ask you for that. I tried to give you something. Yeah. You know. What I'm saying? So, but if I could get to like a, uh, like a cash doll or somebody from Detroit that's popping female, that's got that type of style. I think this could be one for him. I, I've been in her box. Okay. No, I ain't heard back from from her yet, but you know she would be dope. I think she'd kill this track. I think it'd be a big one for her too. You know, um, Griselda signed a female what about artist, a Marty Caesar. I think Jay yeah, Hill should shoot for that. <laughs> I, I hear you. Oh, I said um, because <clears throat> I don't know what first I didn't hear first first. What did you say? I think you say you're searching for a female. I said, what about Meg? Meg the Stallion. What are you doing? <laughs> hey, but, look, but look, it would be it would be right up her alley too. Okay. So it's, it's one of them type of you know type of joints. And it's got and I want it to be the right person. I if if I didn't do that, I'm working with some young artists here in Jacksonville. And I would I would probably just give it to one of them before I do anything if I if I couldn't get it to one of those, you know? Okay. I got a kid. I want to make sure I say his name. His name is Bakdo Nard. B A K K D O E Nard. N A R D. And I'm working on some some music with him right now. A kid got a huge voice. He's a southern a southern kid, so he got that southern that accent southern style swing to him. But he got a huge voice. I think he I think he's gonna be a star. And uh, you'll be hearing you'll be hearing something from him pretty soon too. I'm a, I just recorded a song on him. We're gonna get it mixed. I'm gonna shoot a, I'm gonna shoot the video for him and put that out too. So, see, and that's good now too that you want to work with younger artists now too that you see talents now too because you were one once that young artist. Yeah, and then you know you can kind of help him and guide him. And then I like him because he got the independence about himself. You know, I might tell him, "Yo, you need to do this like this." He'd be like, "Yeah, I know, but I, I kind of wanted it like this." And I'm like, "All right, hey, go go with what you know, you know." 
it's a, it's a reason why you sound good to me when my when my son brought your music to me anyway. So yeah, you know. Do you, what you um, do? Do you ever like catch your kids like listening to like West Side Gun or like uh, like a Bowley James and you come into him like yeah, you know Dad used to rap with this guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, my son know about Bodie. Okay, you know, okay. <laughs> you know, he already know about Bodie. I also had B Major. I don't know if you're familiar with B Major. I'm not his biggest fan, but I, I've heard of him. I'm not going to sit here and say I know everything. Else. Yeah, he uh he used to be in the studio in that studio at that time. Okay. Doing beats, he was in, he was in the 12th grade. Mm-hmm. Yep, before he even went away to college, he ended up going away to uh, University of Michigan. But when he was in the twelfth grade, him and my nephew uh, DJ Ray, they were pre- they were best friends, and he used to bring B Major over there. B Major would come over there with his MPC four thousand when it was brand new. You know, we all had the three thousands and the two thousand. He had this new MPC four thousand. Like, check me out. <laughs> but then he started playing these beats. We like, damn. You make that this kid, is, this kid is fire. Now, keep in mind, at the same time, my label is telling me. Man, what the hell is all these young kids hanging with? He talking about Bodie. He talking about B Major. He talking about DJ Ray. You know, I'm like, this is this is talent right here, bro. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what do you mean? What, mean? what are they doing? This is their talent. Yeah, yeah. They, they here making music. That's what they doing. But all that talent was in that studio, you know, at that time. Now, B Major doing work for Disney, Justin Bieber, Neo. Damn. Yeah, I mean, he major right Damn. Now. Yeah, B Major is mm-hmm. through the roof right now, bro. They show, I remember watching TMZ one time, and Justin Bieber had gotten a little trouble and was getting out of jail, and B Major was the one picking you up in a lamp. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, damn, look at B. The level up is real. Right, you know, so, you know, definitely. You know, that, that, that talent, man, was, was, was amazing. I think, like, because, like, um, I'm a big believer in destiny now, too. And I think, like, everything that you two gents, like, went through in your lifetime, even with the music business, it was destiny for it to happen before you guys even knew it. Because, like, they say that a certain situation that you do put yourself in now, too, and if you just stick with it, like, you can have priceless memories because, like, the, the memories that you guys have and actually live, there's a million people in this city, like, that would kill to have those type of memories. Absolutely. experiences. Yeah. Definitely. You guys yeah. actually, like... And we'll do it different for nothing in the world. Yeah. Well, see, then also, like, it's, it's up to the, the younger group that want to move forward to recognize those individuals and place a value upon that. You know what I'm saying? So, continue to create and mold. This is how you would want to start your agencies and your management companies, your marketing companies. You know, we don't have urban development no more for artist development in yeah. the record labels. You know, so yeah. you got to have these to, yeah. to help boom artists in the direction they want to go to maintain. You know what I'm saying? Once you get it, you get it. But you, like I say, one hit wonders, man. Some cats only want the one hit, though. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you, you know, it's just about, you know, you got to really be in tune with who you're working with and why you're working with. And a big thing is, too, is, like, on who you, on who you look up to because, like, like they're, they're like this is what I like. I want to change about the media and hip hop now too. We have kids like looking up to like um, like that rat. I won't say his name, but yeah, he, right. he, he'll come out of jail saying all this shit, telling on everybody. Well, what's that teaching today's youth? Right. So like, but he was cut from that cloth. See, and, and those who it's, it's the majority isn't cut from that cloth. So it, it's not really a main subject to them. You know what I mean? Yeah. If you're not from the street, you don't know the codes, you know, because cats don't have codes no more. If you don't know the codes and you just out there in that, you know, what you expect? You know what I'm saying? Well, we'll deal with somebody that magnitude. Well, and I also, so, you know, I also want to say one more of the young cats who I didn't bring up when I was talking about the bag rap per se. I don't know if you up on him, but Babyface Ray. Yeah. I'm up I'm on all these cats, man. Hey, I'm up with all the cats. Dude is like, dude is like, you know how Mace was when Mace first came oh, out? Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, yo, yo. Jesus Christ. Yes, yeah, sir. Trust me. Trust me. Play some baby face Ray. I'm, I'm going to write that down. The kid be on that. Like, he hey, got the you... voice. He got the delivery. Baby like, I think, I think he dope. That's, an, that's another young cat who I, who I like, who I love to work with. 
And see, like, I'm not going to come up here and say, like, there is an artist out there pushing, because, like, we do have your own artists, like the ones you said, too, or, like, um, or, like a Kendrick Lamar to release an album, like, to pimp a butterfly at his age, and it's in the Harvard University. Like, that speaks for itself. Yeah. That was a phenomenal piece of work right there. And, like, like, I love how, like, a Detroit artist now, too, like, somebody, like, a big Herc, it's still like you when you hear his name, people will know him now too. He's like, oh, I don't know a big Herc, like, man, like, and, and if it wasn't for that Obi Trice album, Second Rounds on Me, I probably wouldn't even be like, like, uh, I think I know who he is, but man, <laughs> Big Herc, oh, shout out to Big Herc. Yep. Herc is on that '67 riots. Okay, okay. Yep, Herc. I got Herc on there. I got Trick Trick on there. Mm-hmm. Uh, shit, a couple people. See, like, we're, we're, like, even like when, like, when you meet like gatekeepers like first in the in the Detroit community now too. I was curious, Jay Hill, on how important it is to acknowledge the gatekeepers. Yeah, I think it's real important because you know the term gatekeeper comes with you know people who who might have been there before you or you know for a younger guy. I mean, for me, guys like guys like Masi Ski. Uh, chaos, you know, chaos and maestro, a wall. You know, I'm, I'm always speaking, speaking up on them guys because them the guys who used to have videos on TV who I used to come home from school and watch and be like, I want to be like that. I want, I want to be on a video like these guys. Yeah, they from my city, you know. So if they can do it, I know I can do it too. So I felt yeah. like that about the gatekeepers at that time, you know, before me. And the people who was doing what I wanted to do before me, and I always, to this day, acknowledge. I mean, I was just talking to the merciless Amir. He put out mm-hmm. a record, you know, earlier this year with Big Hurt. I made sure I hit him up and told him I thought it was dope and keep doing what he's doing because, like I say, he he helped pave the way for me to even have, you know, the, the small voice that I had. A day without a ride. Yeah, so hey, yo, that's definitely, that right that's there, boy. That was a staple for sure. That I mean, you had to hear that every day, waking up, getting ready for school or something. Yeah. You know what I mean? He was like, what, 14, 15 when he did that shit? Damn. Yeah, so, he, was, you know, he was a youngster. You know, yeah, but you got the guys, man, you know, who paved the way. You know, the chaos and maestro, you know, some boys, man, paved the way. You know, BMW, man, paved the way. You couldn't, pay wait, ball, you couldn't wait for that man. chaos and maestro video to come on every day <laughs> and get to that end part. And their, you know, their joints still going. Was our run DMC. You know what I'm saying? They was our run DMC. So, you know, we, we had promotion. You know, the D always had that going. You know, but it, it's a fine line between a lot of different, you know, subjects. Yeah. You know, when you're moving the way that you're moving. You know what I'm saying? So, sometimes you just can't stick your neck out there. You might have something lingering in the back. People got families or however. You know what I'm saying? But it's we. You know, J- and, and J- as far as J- day, to I, 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 have to, I would have J- to decline. To the that. One of the coldest songs Detroit ever. You know, I, I respectfully decline that. I appreciate your thought acknowledgement at King Low. But at this moment, I wouldn't even say that about myself as being a gatekeeper in the community. Okay. I don't I don't even want that title, you know, um, but I appreciate it. And, and those who I, that will gravitate towards me when I'm able to provide a platform like you do it like you're doing here for me and getting this you know where people here and understanding that you know a personality behind the man who the myth or whatever the legend they want to call these not words i put on myself but when they get to understand the personality the uh the the intensity that i have about this music game and where i would like to see it go especially with the youth elderly it don't matter age to me if i got knowledge i'm able to, to do that or give that out will be it, you know what I'm saying? And I'm with that. But everything is a fair exchange. It has to be a fair exchange when it comes to doing business. Yeah. Business is different than just, you know, that's my homie and his shit hot. Yeah, he fire. Everything he do is dope. It don't work like that in the world of business. You know what I'm saying? So when you have an understanding of people who moving like that and they get it, they get it. You'll have more success in it. When, when they can understand that it's more than just one way to get paid from a song. You know, oh yeah, I think sure. I think probably it's fourteen different ways to get royalties from one song. So when people get that knowledge and need to know that knowledge, they can apply their music, apply their craft, their art in the, in the respective areas. 
We get that placement. Oh yeah, that's big facts right there. Placement and exposure. You know what I'm saying? See, turn the word exposure to a negative thing. I'm exposed you, or such and such been exposed. That's what the game has always been about. Exposure. It's about who you're exposing it to. And once you see who you're exposing it to, become your mark and your fan base, then you can cater to that. I know I sound like a broken record, but No, no. Know. I hope somebody samples it's that. I ain't got a front. <laughs> <laughs> It's the third day, the third avenue. You gotta go about doing it. You know, myself, I I, I know was I was fortunate enough to know like all the names he just dropped about uh the younger artists, the bag rap. You know, here in Detroit, they do their thing. They deserve all the success to come out of it, coming from nothing to grabbing the attention and making something happen. They deserve all of that. You know, um, I was involving myself in different um, areas of you know I was dealing with a property. Um, Man, I was doing a thing where I was helping people find certain buildings. Like this one guy wanted to do a partnership with me in a building. This is after like him seeing that what a guy could do hip hop shop in other little areas and stuff. So I ended up, you know, getting my hands on a, um, a piece of property where I had I had um, interest in. You know, they they didn't know this or, or anything of that nature, but it was just like my I was helping somebody out who got put out of a place, and I was going to help them reestablished but under the pretenses of having business where you know i'm gonna put you in this environment and uh you're definitely not gonna be paying what you would be doing without me so i'm helping you out um just you know make it a monetary interest for me but at the same time we understand that all the tracking that's going to be coming through here is going to be monumental so at the end of the day you had these guys like you know um who he had mentioned t grizz pulls up you know, everybody pulling up from, you know, who's doing their thing, these, the background. So I was fortunate enough in that aspect, in this in this relationship, to be uh, able to stay relevant in that matter to where I'm, I'm seeing that, you know, the guys that's coming through. One of the uh, gentlemen, his name is Ant Beats. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Yes, sir. He's a producer. He's doing his thing real fire. You know, I had uh, known that he was doing shit. He ended up being one of the guys who was renting one of the suites, you know, so his clientele consisted of these guys and he was coming through there. So that's another way that people can see when you're doing good business, you can be relevant when you got guys flowing through there and him being, you know, who he was to the homeboy hell of a hell of a was, you know, that's bro. He from day one, two with us, you know what I'm saying? Chilling at proof house and all this shit together. We were doing that early in the game. So these relationships, Start stacking, start becoming um, uh, in in into uh, relation entering relationships with other people who are in different areas of the game. Like this one guy, I didn't know what his title was in the game, but he seemed to have had relationships, and it was you know floating in because I had put him in a prime real estate, so things was you know working accordingly. But when the business is not solid, things happen to. You know what I'm saying? Take a twist. Things can crumble. Yeah. You see that a lot in the game. You know what I'm saying? And I say that just to put emphasis on making sure people know that their business can be tight. Everything can look sweet. I mean, you can have, um, you can be friends with the jeweler and have all the, you know, the, the hottest jeweler in the city and have all the chains, you know, and people will see that. Or you can be a person of a high stature, um, you know, like a little Wayne, and come out with a fake chain, and people would assume that it's real, yeah, as long as they ain't getting right. nothing. And he paid twenty five dollars for it. That happened a lot. You, you, you see what I'm saying? The impression that people make in the point of view of the perspectives. You know what I'm saying? You know these lines got to be defined. You know, and when you're doing business, you know what I'm saying? Because see, I found all the, all the guys that do the jury now. That was the homeboy Hutch from here in the D. He supplied. Right. He's like with Detroit. He did the D12 chain, you know, the big piece. He did all, you know, he did my carrots and shit. And it was good. And as you know, when they start seeing other artists go there, they ask them who's doing that, then they like, oh, okay, I'm going to go there and get my shit done. You know what I'm saying? So this is the same thing in the music game when building relationships. It's necessary. Instead of everybody hating one another or having a disdain for one another's craft or whatever, you know, some music people don't attract to, but it's still good music, and other people are uh, maybe being consumers of that. Yeah. So just good business is just making sure that that 
project becomes successful, regardless of you consuming it or not. You know, with these elements have to, you know, be a part of a person's moral fabric when they putting all these, you know, crap together. You know, what's some intentions behind it? You know what I'm saying? What's your intention? You know? Yeah. Your, your music is special intention. Well, and even, it's even like how you approach yourself too, as an artist now too, because like, I remember there was a time where drug dealers used to make anti-drug songs, and then now, they never used to portray that. They're like, yeah, they may sell bricks and stuff like that, but when they made the music, they never acknowledged that. Now, you sell a brick, the whole world knows. <laughs> That's going to say... Really say. It, it, but it's like though, it's like what first said now too though it's all about building relationships and how you move now too because if you don't have your business right things can crumble we've seen it most of, look at death row now now let's talk about like the newer generation here what I discovered when our, uh, um, my spiritual advisor in fact showed me this insignia you know when people do logos and things of that nature that's a representation of who they should be or what they represent right their logos their business their music it becomes a part of them. It's a part of their their fabric, their brand, right? So uh, there's one in particular I saw that had a sword going down the middle of two scales, right? And that happened to be an angelic sign. If you went to, you know, angelic magic, you know, uh, alchemy, things of that nature, right? you know, the world, the workings of the, the world, magic, things of that nature. Now, what it stands for is so, it's so positive. It's, it's so, like I said, it's angelic. Do they know what it stands for? Won't know until we have a conversation. But at the same time, the music is not a representation of that that sign, nor are the images that they portray, right? But on a higher on a higher scale, I believe personally, because see, at one time, and I'm sure Jay Hill can attest to this, it was about us grabbing attention of somebody, even if something that we don't really particularly talk about, let's say in our rhymes, we was talking about a lot of fucking people up, you know, being ass, smashing niggas, period. That was our thing, right? But we want to grab the attention of those who are like us and then take that and elevate that. You dig what I'm saying? So once we got attention, we can elevate them because that wasn't our, our main goal wasn't to be money-driven, materialistic. You, you understand what I'm saying? Or just talk about ladies getting bras and fly cars. Once we got their attention, it's to elevate things to the next level because it's it's more than that. People die for that shit. Want, uh, which, yeah, when you want to get the audience's attention to be able to make them hear the message. Absolutely. Right. And that's why I salute cats like that. You know, that group I'm talking about is like Griselda. You know what I'm saying? Because that, I, I see something that's not particularly what the message is that they're given at this point in time. But later down the line, you can understand that they value for life they hold dear. They may not still be, you know, doing what they was doing and sitting in music, you know what I'm saying? But now they can grab the attention of those and elevate and show that we don't have to do that no more. Let me help you along the way. Still be the genuine character that I am that reach out to me. Because some cats feel like they they unapproachable. Yeah. And a lot of cats are approachable. I was one of them that people felt like they couldn't approach. But, I, but to get to know me for five minutes is to know me forever, man. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Yeah, that's that. So, I'm going to say this. Salute you again, King Lo. You know what I'm saying? For, you know, taking this opportunity and acknowledging us the way you do, man. Yes, you know, sir. Do you do you know? Definitely. I appreciate it. I appreciate yeah. you guys now too. Like I'll never forget, like the first time I was sent the first born, uh, first born to DM, man. I, I, I remember your Jay. I'll tell you this real quick. Uh, and then we'll get back to the music. When I first sent him a DM, I didn't think it was him. I was like, um, do you mind going on video chat with me just to just so I know it's you? And then it was history was like, from there. As soon as when he I did, was he like, was, I was like, I made it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I was just could you just never know on the internet I was like there's a weird there's some guy posing as just blaze DM and checks you know come to my house in yeah, New Hampton like well no I'm here for sure for sure I just wanted yeah, to make man. sure I'm like before we do this interview I need to know you're the real firstborn that I listened to on Black Rift Bros and yeah sure enough it was yeah you um, know what I had to, I have to give that respect about like the internet to this man right here you know what I'm saying because when it was doing D12 World 
the um, platform that they had, it was just starting off. We still on dial up, I think it was. Oh, damn. <laughs> was, I don't know, but I mean, <laughs> we, were trying to, we started moving ahead of the game a little bit, but he, he opened up my eyes to the internet and showing that how much of a tool it could be. You know what I'm saying? When he started posting on the walls and stuff, um, that, that shit jumped off the, off the meter. You know what I'm saying? The dirty heads, you know, then the dirty heads, now you have to stand. You know what yeah. I'm saying? You know how that how this is working. You know, so that that uh that that transformation is, is crazy, man. Dealing with the internet thing. So it does make it more more um uh, intimate to where you could just be sitting right here in the living room with somebody. Well, I also have to remember now too, because like I was privileged like to experience life without the internet. But I have to remember, there's kids out there who think like this internet was always there. You guys come from a time where there was no internet within the music. Ah, that's my drink right there. I got that in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you in the front. Um, but but like but like that's what I was saying though now too like. Like, it's all about, like, how you present yourself now, too. Because you can give off the wrong image, like a, like the rat, and then people can always assume that you're a rat. But if you're a real mm-hmm. artist, like, like, a, like um, uh, I just want to say something that I haven't been saying. Somebody like a Benny the Butcher, who never gave up and continued their craft, and now they're in the New York Times for album of the year above Taylor Swift. Like, what the fuck, man? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a dope accomplishment, you know, and that's what it said coming from that. Yeah, and well deserved. I heard I heard about Benny the Butcher before I heard of any of the Griselda members. I, 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 that yeah, I heard. was the one. That was the one who I was locked in on listening to. Yeah, you'll be if you actually like when people actually like look into like Griselda's story and like the two like the Benny used to go by two chains. Yo, like the I can't wait for this guy to come on the show. Oh, man. Um, but yeah, but for, for Jay Hill now too, um, you're in the middle of writing your magnum opus now too. Now I was curious because you have the one video that you put out now too. Now is this being close to being released, or you still kind of like want to take your time with it before you actually put it out for uh, the world to hear? Really, I was saying to myself, you know, I want to record one more song, uh, and I I like I even tell you what it's about. It's going gonna, it's gonna to pretty much be a letter to Joe Biden okay. about, uh, you know, if you don't receive this Democratic nomination and you expect us to vote for you, this it's a, it's a list of demands that, you know, we're going to be putting on the table, not just for him, but for anybody else that's going to be garnering our vote, you know. Uh, and I, ha- I haven't written it yet, but I, I know where I'm going with it. I actually heard the track that I want to sample last night. You know, me and my wife was watching something on TV, and it came on. I was like, "Shazam that right now!" <laughs> <laughs> she, she shazammed it. I got who it is. So I haven't even made it yet. I'm probably gonna make it. Uh, I'll probably make it in the morning. I, I know I won't do it today because I, I got uh, some things I need to do. But after that song, I think this this piece is gonna be ready. Okay. Yeah, I just got a. Uh, I got two songs. I'm, I'm about done mixing right now, and then you know make that song, write it, record it, and mix it, and I should be finished. I already started working on the artwork for the. Uh, yeah, album. dude, artwork too. Yeah, you're jack of all trades. Yeah, I mean, but it's like, for one, it, I mean that kind of came out of necessity because you know can't pay everybody for everything that you want to get done. Yeah, that's true, yeah. So I was like, you know, I gotta I gotta just try to find a way where I can learn how to do all this stuff myself, so. Well, some of the artists out there need to cut and paste. Like, I was like, no, bro, I can do that. I learned learned Photoshop, I learned Premiere Pro, and you know, I I can do all that stuff myself. There's some things that I would love to do video-wise. Yeah. You know, that I would need some help with. I actually, uh, I reached out to Mario Butterfield. Oh, wow. He did uh, some work for R.J. Payne. Yeah, I, I sent him... I actually sent him a song that's not going to be on this particular project, but it's the other EP that I said I already had finished. It's like it's like the illest, the illest story rap. You know them old classic story raps from hip-hop? Yeah. I, I wrote one of them. Okay. So I said, I said that he the only one got that song because I want him to start concepting the video. 
but I want him to shoot that video for me. But, you know, I, I would like to work with, you know, other people as far as doing stuff like that, shooting videos, because, I mean, you limit it when you can just set, set a camera up or, or I got to walk around with the camera. <laughs> yeah. the but, you know, I pulled off, shit, three sweet videos in a row. And here I put out one of them. I went to the pull out that drum. <laughs> uh, people pay for the drone shot all day. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, try- I'm actually trying to get a drone right now if I can get my wife to start spending money on her new uh, business. <laughs> uh, start a new, she got uh, the Cricut, Cricut, what's the name of that machine? Cricut machine, so she makes, <laughs> she makes tumblers, she makes t-shirts. Okay. Signs, and the name of her business is Eudora Creations. They do have so, you know, okay. I posted that on my, page, on my page about three days ago, so you can go on her site and look at that stuff, and she made real nice, real nice stuff, so you can order. order I'll throw it up in the link, too, when this goes up, so it get in tune. Yeah. <laughs> you said, say it again? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Say it again, I didn't hear you. Oh, I said I'll throw the link up when the interview goes up now in the description. Okay, like I'll like sure, throw yeah, the link I'll up. I'll make sure I send, I send you the link, you know, so everybody can check that, so... We do we do all of that here from from the house too. She got her whole production area upstairs. It's, it's brand. She's telling me to say stuff. <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally started in like the last three weeks, but she already making sales. She got orders, you know, backed up right now. So she up she upstairs working on a lot of that stuff right now. Okay. But you know, I'm a creative man. Yeah. And I love being around creative stuff. And like I can't wait to hear like even like the, with the track that you have to write now to Justin Joe Joe Biden now too like that's what I love about some hip hop now too I love like the like when artists really get political with it like uh, Ice Cube's first album now I've been playing that album like crazy this past week yeah prophetic was it yes sir right back then yeah that was thirty years ago and like I have to keep telling them, I'm like this was thirty I wasn't even born when this came out yeah it was. It was, it was uh, prophetic. I mean, Cube had me on ten back then. I, I mentioned that in this in this album. Okay, okay, um, that's good to know. Yeah. Okay, I talk mm-hmm. about I talk about how he had you know how he had me feeling and stuff I learned. I got a song. I got a song called uh, African Medallions. Oh, where uh, you know at that point it was like eighth grade, I believe. Wearing the leather African medallions was just. As dope as having the coldest gold iced out chain is right now, like you, know, you had to have you had to have one. I had three. <laughs> you know, I talk about when I first went to this store called Trade Wins with my boy Demario Penn, and I bought my first one. You know, I I thought I had I thought I had a hundred thousand dollar chain around my neck wearing African medallions because we watch X Clan on videos on TV. And they made they made that important to us because they made it because it was important to them. So that's that's the importance of the message that you get from the music. You know, when 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 the rappers were wearing HBCU sweaters, yeah. everybody wanted to have an HBCU sweater. You know, so that stuff like that is is what hip hop is all about. You know, we it, we got to move the needle. We got to yeah. be the ones who give the message to the masses that represents, you know, our voice, our people, our culture, our youth, you know, and and, and those were the things that those artists did, did for us back in the day. That's a sign of brand new. Year. So I made a whole song on this album, the African Medallion song, where I talk about all of those artists, KRS-One. Public uh, Enemy. Public, public Enemy, when, when they were making songs about all of these things and teaching me stuff. I knew nothing about a, a, a lyric that I say in the song. You know, I learned AFR, ICA, Angola, Sorrento, Zimbabwe. I didn't even know about those places, shamefully, at that age. But I learned that through hip-hop. You know? So it's, it's incumbent upon you as a musician to be able to throw stuff out like that when you got the people's ear. And they listen to it, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it's always a blessing now too when they actually get it and like don't ask quite like it's like 
this actually taught me something instead of walking away and like, I'm going to go pop pills. Like, it's actually, it would teach you something when you walk away to make you think about it. It's like, damn, yeah. like, I should it really made me have to go it. look stuff up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Books. We, we have you too. Yeah, like, uh, you know? where's the book? I, I can't find it right now, but I have one of the books of, um, it was the 48 Laws of Power now, too. And I remember people were telling me, oh, you could just watch it on YouTube. I'm like, no, man, I need, the, I need the book. I need the book. Proof, proof put me on that book. Oh. Man, that was, look, look, man, that was, it, it ain't just like that. It was the fact that he made it a mandatory thing to do. Yep. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yep. It, he ran it like a boot camp. He was like, look, you got to know these here. You know what I'm saying? And it made sense. Because yeah. he like, navigate through. But it's so overrated now, you know, because people taking and using these tools and they're using them for the wrong things, man. You know what I'm saying? So it, you have to take responsibility to start within the home when it comes to any type of educational platform, period. That way, when you talk about you got little ones, you're dealing with little ones, they're growing up, they're absorbing things. You know yeah. what I'm saying? They're absorbing it. You know, so, but you want them to take the medicine, but you don't want them to overdose and you don't want them to take not enough can't just right. give them you gotta have an understanding of it uh, absolutely absolutely yeah we see and then like um having the understanding is the first step to making a change that we need now too um so like i said we've got another three minute mark now too and uh this is probably one of the longest interviews i've done with first board i think we're at almost three hours now Man, uh, so, but hey, I want to, I want to, I want to extend uh, my offer now to to you to Jay Hill. Um, when you release this album, I would love to have you back on, and I would love to break down the track lyric by lyric. Oh, well, I've gotten a bit better at the lyric by lyric breakdown, but I'd love to break down the album with you the same way I did with Ty Ferris. Yeah, this one, this one will definitely be definitely be lyric by lyric worthy. Okay, I would, okay. I would love to sit down and break down, you know, what, what, what I'm saying in the songs and the reason is behind it all because mm -hmm. there's a lot of deep meaning and every song, every song got something in it and they all different. You See, know, it's so. good to hear when we can expect something different. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jay Hill, you, uh, uh, were you planning on uh, expanding out to the West Coast and messing around out there in Vegas with kills or whatnot, hey, man? Actually, actually I'm, I'm planning on getting out West this year. I, uh, I've been talking to uh, House Shoes, and I'm I'm gonna put this when I put this record out. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put it out on Wax too. Okay. So I, was just, I was just kicking it with him about you know different strategies as far as being able, being able to put the wax out. You know who I should go with, uh, and different ways to be able to market the wax. Also, uh, I'm gonna have merch for it. My wife gonna be doing the shirts, and uh, you know they'll they'll just have. Uh, just different shirts, you know, with different themes. Uh, it's, it's it's a lot, man. We it's, when you it's, when you get out there in Vegas, I want you to put an ear on the street, man. Look out, uh, even reach out to on the, on the internet if need be. Um, there's a homeboy out that way, man. He's real down to earth cat. He making a lot of noise, and um, he he about that shit, man. And his name is uh, Dizzy Wright, man. You should reach out to him one time. Tell Dizzy Wright. Homeboy. Before like we close out now too. Um, Jay Hill, is there anything that you like to plug in? Um, maybe when we can expect this album now? The first single's already out, from my understanding, right? Yeah, uh, 87 Celtics uh, is out on YouTube. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't put it on any platforms yet. Okay. I was, um, I was going, well, I don't know, what you think? Should I put it out as a single? And then, I don't know. I was going to wait and just put it all out at the same time. Ah, uh, see, because you never know what people may gravitate towards now, too. And then when you put it out, you may see the song that gets the most reception. It's like, okay, that's the video. Right. But uh, pretty much, uh, you know, once I'm done with the last song, you know, get everything mixed up, uh, you know, have my artwork together. I want to have my merch. I want to have my merch uh, definitely together. And then, uh, you know, have the, the uh, wax portion, you know, all figured out how I'm going to do that. Because I haven't, I haven't put out wax since the singles that I put out for Street Fang. Oh, damn. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So this would be, you know, a little different for me. So pretty, it'll pretty much be just organizing that. I would guess maybe within a month and a half. I want to get it out as soon as possible, like I say, because I don't want nobody 
stepping over my subject matter. Oh, yeah. And especially, you know, like, like... I talked about some stuff that, you know, people have hit on, but, you know... Never fully dove into through. it. Yeah, it's fresh and new, so I want to try to get it out before, you know, anybody else talking about stuff I am. <laughs> well, and then and plus now, too, like, you put a lot of thought into this now, too. You don't want somebody to come and say, oh, we're just going to take... When he put thought into and then just flip it. Like, nah, it's like, I did it first, and I'm going to show you guys how to do it. Right, right. So, I mean, even with the 87, I, you know, not, not to toot my own horn, man, <laughs> but <laughs> even with the 87 Celtics video, I made that song the day after uh, Ahmaud Arbery. Oh, wow. Yeah. R.I.P. Right. that young man. And that... That was a, that was the incident that inspired that song. And as I started making a song, you know, other other things, you know, start I started filtering in there. But that was the that was the spark of of this album, pretty much. Okay. That, that was the that was what made me record the eighty seven Celtics. And as I say, that song, eighty seven Celtics, was actually supposed to be the last song from yeah. another EP that I had already started. And I just had to, I thought it was so unique. For one, I wanted to make more like it. And then when I started making them, I'm like, well, shit, they're coming along pretty fast. I might be able to make a whole EP like this. Yeah. And then that's just how it happened. Because there's certain moments that bring that inspiration and they were just like what you said, they would just fly out the paper, like fly out the pen to the paper. Right, I mean, I, yeah, I, I want this one to live forever. Like, this one out. This is one I know I'll be proud of when I'm 80. You know, and I'll probably still be making music, knowing me. Yeah, <laughs> but that be the one you'd be like. That was the one. That be your but reasonable yeah. doubt, I'd say. I feel this one will be, you know, still photograph in time. You know, oh, and I'm I'm already proud of it, and it ain't finished. But uh. I, 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 I can't wait till it is, and I can't wait to put it out for everybody to be able to hear it. And, like, I can't wait for hearing this now. So, you just said uh, some of the subject matter that we have in this, too. Like, I said, you, you're welcome back. When this comes out, we'll break it all down at first. I don't know where it is right now, but hey, we'll break it down all down track by track. And hey, maybe even lyric by lyric. Because you said it's one of those um, albums now, too, that it's for lyric for lyric now, too. So, I love paying attention to the beat, I mean, sorry, to the actual lyrics, as opposed to the beat, the beat can be whatever, it's what you say, it what really hits me, because right. I know some songs, like, I don't like that beat, but the message he has, oh, I fucked right. with it. And how I tried to record this, like, the tempo and the style beats that I use is more of a, the album reads more like a speech Okay. than it does a rap. I mean, like, if you listen to 87 Celtics, like, I'm more talking, more talking to you, you know? And that's kind of how I built the album. I slightly rose the vocals up, you know, a little bit louder than I probably would have before because, you know, I wanted to be more of, more about the vocals. And like I say again, it reads, it reads more like a speech than like, like music sometimes when I listen to it. Yeah. Okay. Well, man, um, I'm really glad that we had this conversation. You actually came and actually told some of your story up on here now, too, when it came to your background of music. Even answering some of the questions I had ever since a teenager. I was like, how do you, how do you make this? But hey, and from the bottom of my heart, my guy, that means the world to me now. Um, is there anything you'd like to plug in before I let you go? Uh, I think I got everything in. Uh, pretty much. Uh, we didn't talk about I have a See Some Friends EP I put out in 2006. That's on all platforms right now. Okay. It's, three, it's only three songs, but it's actually, uh, it, it talks about a lot of what went on when right around the time that Proof died. And uh, and after it, I actually talk about on there, on that album, when I got the phone call at like four in the morning about what happened with Proof and somebody who was there with him as it ha when it happened was the person that called me. And I oh. wasn't saying the name. I mean, everybody know Horny Mac was Proof's right-hand man, was always... Well, well, no, he wasn't his right-hand man. I ain't gonna say that. Firstborn was always Proof's right-hand man. Yeah. But he was always on the scene. And, you know, 
know, ain't really seen or heard much from him since. But he called me at like four o'clock in the morning, like telling me to come pick him up and told me proof is dead. And I'm like, where the hell is proof? And why is he dead and you ain't with him? You know? So I talk about that on that EP. Uh, talk about when I when I drove to the Michigan building that day. I was actually the first person to get there and open the door. And uh, then Super MC came. And, you know, and that's, that's when everybody started showing up there, man. It was just, just screwed up day. But I talk about a lot of that uh, on that See Some Friends EP that I put out. And like I said, you know, that's it's on all the platforms. You can search that anywhere and find it. Was it uh, was was releasing that therapeutic for you? Say it again? Was releasing, like, like because you put it into three songs. And when you're touching on those subjects, was it therapeutic for you to release yeah, it? Most definitely. And, uh, and all my music is. You That's know, good to I, hear. I speak about a lot. I mean, if, if you ever wanted to know my life, all you got to do is sit down and play all of my songs. I was going to say, just hit play. Yeah, I'm going to eventually tell you, you can feel the dots in if you if you, if you you got it here. You know, but, uh, yeah, that, that I put that out on uh, in uh, 2016 on, uh, on Proof Day. Okay. And it's, yeah. and it's good to hear, like, like you... <laughs> Like even before, like what you said, what he told you, he put that those memories and I mean that information in your head so you can pass it down to your son. And th those are priceless memories that you, you just money can't buy. Right, most definitely. All right. Well, like I said, Jay Hill, man, you're you're one of the most phenomenal MCs that I was well heard of since you know since I was thirteen. I know I was still, I'm twenty nine now, but hey, I always knew that you guys were. Detroit man had some incredible MCs right now too. So like I said, man, you're welcome back on the show. Even if you want to promote anything, man, just say hey, all you gotta do is hit my DM and we'll make it happen. All right, for sure. I, I greatly appreciate you having me on. Anytime. Uh, can't wait till it's all chopped up and put together. Oh yes, sir. Don't worry, it'd be a no. very phenomenal job. You'd be like, damn, how'd this kid do this? <laughs> um, but is there anything you'd like to plug in though before I let you go, J Hill? No, that's pretty much it. All right. Okay. Like I said, I put your wife's link up in the in the description when the side. Just send me that, and then we'll let from there. All right. I see you. I see you there. All right. And with that being said, this is another classic interview, and I know I say class a lot, but no, classic interview from the desk low, featuring my guy Jay Hill. So. And we had first born, but he kind of cut out near the end. So yeah. But you all will watch this now too. Shout out to first born when you watch the final edit. <laughs>